Hello, and welcome to another episode of the Demi Taste Podcast, where we do a little bit of tasting and a lot of talking. Uh, it is the coming up on the second week of April ish, which means that it is just about time for the quarterly dry week in the Whiskey Lodge. You can find a link to the Whiskey Lodge in the video description. Uh, on that topic of taking dry time, our special guest today is Sydney Jones of Few Spirits to give us a version of her talk that she gave at ACSA about booze on the brain. Uh, so basically we're talking about mental health in the spirits industry, both for producers and consumers and anybody who enjoys whiskey. So this is a great lead into our dry week. And without further ado, I'd love to let Sydney introduce herself and tell us a bit about a uh, few spirits and then we'll get into the main topic. Thank you so much, Doug and Phil, for having me. I'm really excited to be here. Uh, a disclaimer before I start talking too much, I have a very inquisitive cat, so you might see me batting at my screen at any given point. It's because she's trying to get at my uh, mixed nuts that I'm going to snack on while we're talking, So, or she might pop up on the screen. I don't know. She's very cute, but she does keep things spicy and interesting for me whenever I'm recording. Uh, so putting that out there. But as Doug mentioned, um, I am the head distiller of Few Spirits. We're located up in Evanston, Illinois. So right outside of Chicago, like literally a mile away. So we're considered Chicago land. Uh, and we have been operating for about 13 years, making world-class bourbons and whiskeys. Uh, we made gin for a while as well. A lot of people know us for our gin production, but nowadays we're just focused on whiskey. And I'll get in a little bit more to Fuse history and things of that nature. Uh, I do not have a corporate background. Uh, my fiance does. He deals with PowerPoint presentations all the time. I do not. I love them. I think they're very fun to make. So I made one for today. Uh, so Doug, if you want to go ahead and bring that up. I have a lot of fun with them. So nice. welcome to my presentation, Booze on the Brain, Mental Health and Sobriety, because it's such an important topic in this industry. Uh, I talk about this to fellow professionals, and I like talking to whiskey clubs about it. Uh, whiskey and distilled spirits is something that I very much enjoy, but it's important to keep in mind what they are and the impact they can have, especially in a negative sense. So if we want to roll to the second slide, my introduction. So this is me. Uh, you can see on the right hand side, that is professional distiller me. I've been distilling for about eight years now. But on the left side of me is baby Sydney. She is fresh out of college. Uh, I graduated from the University of Florida in 2014 with a bachelor's in psychology. And that was my career path for a very long time. I was very set on going into a career in mental health care. Uh, I was very passionate about it. Uh, I moved to the Tennessee, Kentucky area, like literally right on that border uh, to pursue a uh, LCSW, so a licensed clinical social worker degree uh, at Austin P State University. I was getting ready to apply. I was working uh, in a social work office doing casework as an intern, uh, really getting excited about this future and mental health care. And then I discovered whiskey, which is what you kind of do when you are in that part of the country uh, and you're, you have access to such great distilleries like right at your doorstep uh, in Kentucky and Tennessee both. So I started touring these places on the weekends because it's just what you do when you live there. And I really fell in love not only with drinking whiskey, but the production behind it and the science behind it and the history and the tradition. And it was kind of a head over heels kind of love and I purchased every book I could find on the internet. I read as much as I could. And thankfully for me, there happened to be a really outstanding world-class distillery in my town uh, called MB Roland. Um, they've gotten a lot of attention uh, recently. Uh, they've grown quite a bit. They were founded in 2009. Uh, Jackie Zykan worked with them on Hidden Barn. She's got a single barrel pick coming out this week that, that she did with them. But they're an incredible operation. And they kind of gave me my first shot. Uh, at Distilled Spirits work. They hired me as a uh, tour guide and a retail associate, but at the time the operation was so small that all employees wore a lot of hats and they, they saw that I had this interest in production specifically. So they kind of started to slowly apprentice me into production. And that's kind of how I got my foothold 
back in 2016, which is crazy to say, because I feel like I've been doing this so long now. Uh, fast forward, um, I moved up there with uh, a man that I was married to at the time that uh, ended up in a horrific divorce, uh, which was kind of fueled by infidelity and domestic abuse. And I'm very comfortable talking about this now. This is very much a part of my identity, but it led me to some pretty dark places that ended up with a uh, hospitalization uh, and a psychiatric ward. Uh, so I'm a lot of fun, essentially. I'm, I'm great. I'm great at parties. I've got a lot of, a lot of jokes, but uh, in all seriousness, uh, this was a really dark period of my life, and I ended up having to leave my dream distilling job to move back down to Florida to be with my family in the wake of all this wreckage of my life. Uh, so I moved back down there with my folks, moved in with them, uh, started healing. At the time, there was a new distillery being built in my hometown of Jacksonville, Florida. Uh, they're called Manifest Distilling. And I essentially just showed up there one day with a resume and told them to hire me, and they did. <laughs> really weird. Uh, and I was there for four years and, you know, making whiskey and distilling spirits and working in that capacity really healed me. We talk a lot about alcohol and how it can wreck families and ruin people. And we'll talk a little bit about the risks of overindulgence today. Uh, but for me, alcohol saved me. It's really the only reason that I am still here is because it gave me something to live for when I didn't have anything else. Uh, and then fast forward a few years, a uh, few years, uh, I reached out to Paul Pletko, my current boss. He's the founder of Few Spirits. Uh, he had posted on his personal Instagram that he was looking to hire a creative and artistic distiller. And I was kind of looking for a life change at this point. I was ready to get out of Florida. Uh, I, I felt strong enough to kind of leave the cradle of my hometown and my family. And I wanted to spread my wings a little bit. And miraculously, he also hired me. Really weird how this keeps on happening. Uh, but I moved up to few almost to the day, like three years ago, and I've been distilling for them ever since. And uh, it's been a really weird kind of way of stumbling into distillation. But we've been doing this for about eight years now. Uh, I have done a lot of outside study through uh, trade schools like the Siebel Institute of Technology, uh, a lot of conferences. So a lot of independent coursework since I don't have a formal uh, STEM background. Uh, that being said, psychology is something that's still very much near and dear to my heart. And you guys will see as we kind of talk about the importance of sobriety uh, when it comes to uh, mindful drinking in this industry. So we want to move forward a slide. We'll talk a little bit about FEW and uh, what FEW uh, stands for, how our production works, what we make a little bit. So we'll go forward a slide because I'm very proud of it because I worked very hard on this, this presentation. PowerPoint's fun. I don't know what everybody complains about. So a few <laughs> spirits. <laughs> uh, so we can actually go forward one more slide. This was just a decorative decorative accent. So this is uh, our distillery. Uh, we operate out of three distinct locations in Evanston. They're all within a mile of each other. Uh, but we are a true brain glass distillery. We have been for 13 years making all of our spirits from that raw grain uh, to its final form in a bottle. So this is our main location, uh, which houses our stills. We also do all of our uh, mashing, our fermentation, and our barrel filling at this location as well. Uh, so we currently right now are mashing and distilling six days a week. Last year, we were doing this six days a week, but two shifts a day. This year, we're down to one shift a day as we focus on some more experimental bottlings. But when we're in full gear, we're running two shifts a day. Uh, and we are mashing bourbon or rye whiskey and a little bit of single malt sprinkled in there as well. So we're focused really on whiskey production now. Our bourbon is going to be a 70% corn, 20% rye, 10% malted barley mash. Uh, this is also fermented with a uh, beer yeast. We do not use traditional distillers yeast for any of our products. Uh, and our rye whiskey mash bill is going to be the inverse of that. So 70% rye, 20% corn, 10% malted barley. And that is fermented with a wine yeast. And I'll get into why that's really cool in a minute here. Uh, 
We also do an American single malt. We were actually one of the first producers of American single malt. We just don't do it on a huge scale. Uh, we do it on a very, very small scale. Uh, but my fa- my boss, Paul, he actually helped write the definitions for American single malt for the American Single Malt Society. So we do a 100% cherry wood smoked uh, single malt. That's absolutely fantastic. And that has been a product that we release in such small quantities and it's aging and it's changing and it's getting more years on it. The barrels that we're using, the cooperage is different. So each bottling is really unique and it's been fun to see it evolve in my time here. Uh, But we are uh, mashing primarily bourbon and rye right now. Those will then ferment for about three to four days, uh, depending on where we're at in the week. And then we will uh, strip that whiskey. So we will pump it through a still and strip all of our alcohol out from all the grain and the water and produce our low wines, which is just a very rough rudimentary alcohol with, if you look on the far side, you'll see that there is a very skinny column still. Um, That is a 16 plate stainless steel Vendome column still. It's actually one of the first craft uh, Vendome column stills actually installed uh, in the country. They've gotten very, they've gotten to be very, very common, uh, but ours is one of the oldest that's running, which is, I think is really cool. Um, so that is where we're stripping out all this funky alcohol from this grain and noting that it is stainless steel. There's no copper, so it's not removing any of these sulfur compounds. It's creating a very meaty low wine, uh, which is fun. Uh, it's a very, very pungent. It's got a lot of congeners and it's mixed, uh, but it's very much a raw distillate that you would not want to taste, you would not want to put into a barrel. Uh, but that low wine is typically coming off the still at about 120 proof. And we're getting anywhere between uh, 200 to 240 proof gallons of that off of a distillation. For the uninitiated, a proof gallon is one gallon of 100 proof alcohol. And that's just how we as distillers measure quantities. Um, So that's how we kind of quantify things. But uh, from there, we will then move it over to that beautiful middle still that you see there. That is our finishing still, which we're basically using as a doubler. Uh, And that is where we're going to redistill our low wines into high wines or new make. And that is what is eventually going to go into a barrel. So this is a 500 liter uh, Coda pot still. It's coming to us from Germany. Uh, It's a hybrid, so it can function at various points in its running time as a column. It can also function as a pot. It allows us to kind of switch as it's running between these two functions. Uh, You can see it's got sight glasses, and they're very similar to a column. That cap that you see at the top is what we call a deflegmator. So that helps us as we're running the distillation. We can push that proof up a little higher and stretch out our distillation a little bit longer. Uh, being that this is a batch style of distillation, which you see with pot stills and these hybrid stills, they have a beginning, they have a middle, they have an end. We are doing all of this distillation by taste. Uh, it's worth noting with few spirits, all of our whiskeys, all 13 years have been a manually driven operation. There's nothing automated about what we do, which I think makes it really special. Uh, so we are tasting for heads, hearts, and tails uh, coming off of every distillation. For those that don't know, heads, methanol and acetone based, it's what comes off first at a very high proof. We don't want that. That gets cut away. Hearts is the good stuff. That's what's actually going to go into the barrel. That's the bulk of our run. Uh, and then tails is kind of the dredges. It's low proof, uh, high water content, high oil content. So we don't want that to create these vegetal weird flavors in our distillation. But in small quantities, they can give our distillate some body and fat and taste good. So really the trick here is making these cuts between heads, hearts, and tails. So that's a big part of my job is uh, training my distillers and getting them all on the same page in terms of a cohesive tasting vocabulary. So this distillation will yield a high wine that is about 140 proof. uh, And we'll then take that alcohol and proof it down to about 117.5. And then we'll fill it into our 53 gallon charred new oak American barrels that we get from either independent safe company or barrel mill in Minnesota. Um, We use a number three char with a medium toast underneath that char and on the heads. Uh, And then we're aging from anywhere between four to six years. And we've got plenty of stock that's aging longer as well. And I'll talk a little bit more about that. On the far left, you'll see a tiny little still. That is uh, our recently decommissioned uh, gin still. Uh, That is what we were producing few gin on for a very long time. 
Uh, so she's no longer operational and running, but when she was, she was very fun to play around with. Uh, but right now we're just primarily running those two stills. Any questions, Doug? I'm just kind of rambling at this point. Yeah, uh, I could probably come up with a few. I was definitely uh, enjoying your presentation, though. So um, when you said the, the the first run is the the far right of the picture, right? Yeah. Uh huh. When you when you said the one in the back, I wasn't quite sure if that yeah. was far yeah. right. Yeah. Okay. So it has. It looks like twelve windows. So it actually goes through the roof there. Oh, what you cool. can't see from the Glen Karen is that we've cut a hole through the roof. <laughs> uh, so it's a 16 plate column. Whenever we actually have to go and do maintenance and clean out this still, uh, we actually have to don uh, roofing harnesses and climb up onto the roof to uh, access it. Uh, so it's, it's a 16 plater. Awesome. That's, yeah. that's very cool. So I have my standard, uh, extremely serious, hard-hitting question. Mm -hmm. Have you named the stills? Um, I have. Um, usually it's a uh, douche or bitch or something along those. It's said in anger. <laughs> uh, <laughs> um, they are not formally named. Uh, but uh, I know at one job that I was at, we were running two stills, and I would jokingly call them uh, Destiny and Destiny's Child. Uh, but these two do not actually have <laughs> formal names. That is something that we should actually get on because it's, it's unlucky to run an, a non-named still. I know what I call them, uh, but I'll have to ask <laughs> my distillers what they call them. The The column still is definitely a little bit more finicky. Uh, it can kind of be prone to clogging sometimes as column stills are. So for example, like if we get a batch of corn in that isn't like completely finely ground to our milling specifications. Like sometimes we'll get corn in that has like some whole chunks in there and that will clog up our column uh, and make it kind of a pain in the ass to run. Uh, whereas the, uh, the middle still there, she's very cooperative. I love her. She's an angel that's never done a thing wrong in her life. The still on the right is kind of the problem child. So they're named appropriately when I'm when I'm operating them. I'm gonna knock on wood that uh, has never done anything wrong. <laughs> Let's hope yeah, that that's very <laughs> true. There's so many things that can go wrong, and a big part of my job is uh, troubleshooting them and project managing and uh, making sure I don't blow up the city block, as I like to joke, which will never happen. We're very good at our jobs, but yeah. Yeah, definitely don't want that to happen. Um, <laughs> just to take a step back to the intro real quick. Uh, first of all, I just wanted to thank you for sharing that and, oh, and your yeah. vulnerability. Uh, I think that that pretty well sets the tone for this conversation, right? Sobriety is a, is a serious uh, topic of conversation, um, taking your dry time and, and having a responsible relationship with alcohol and also celebrating what it does for us. Uh, mm -hmm. I know for me, uh, tasting a spirit is like a meditation, right? Mm -hmm. it, it is one of the few things where I can, I can just sort of shut out the rest of the world and just focus on something that's not going to stress me out for a little while. Uh, so yeah, uh, I can relate to that. And, and that's one of the things I really appreciate about whiskey. But, you know, when I first started getting into reviewing spirits and I told my parents about that, their sort of first reaction was, you're drinking for a hobby? Don't you think that could be a problem? Mm -hmm. And I said, well, you know, before before I even got to this point, you know, I joined a community and I and I made sure that we were going to do regular dry time. And that was mm -hmm. that was my way of holding myself accountable and giving an invitation to uh, the people that I'm sharing my tasting notes with to do the same. Yeah. And we'll talk a little bit more about dry time and like why it's good and like how I incorporate it into my practice as a person who literally am required for my job to taste high, high proof alcohol every single day. Not that I'm swallowing, but still like you're still getting some absorption uh, yep. in your mouth whenever you taste. Uh, but alcohol played a very big role in the domestic abuse that I endured and survived. Uh, but it also really kind of gave me my like main character redeeming arc. Uh, so it's definitely a double-sided coin and it's important to remember that it is a double-sided coin. Uh, and I love that you guys are doing this dry week because I don't see enough whiskey clubs that emphasize that. And uh, this is a really important part of being a responsible member of this community in this industry. Yep. Yeah. Uh, but bringing it back to the spirits, of course, um, I figure if we're going to drink anything, Phil and I today, 
uh, because we're, it's, it's not dry week yet, even though this mm -hmm. is a dry week themed show. Um, next week, actually, next Thursday will be our actual dry time. Um, we could either say, eh, we're just not going to drink anything today to be on theme. Or we could say, as long as we're talking about few spirits, Phil I mean, and I you might as have, well. Exactly. Right. Yeah. Uh, we each have a bourbon to hand. Um, so you, you mentioning the relatively low quantity <laughs> of, um, here, I'll, I'll make our faces bigger for the moment. Uh, <laughs> you mentioned the relatively low quantity of American single malt that you put out. Um, obviously, uh, I'm more or less heavily focused on American single malt. Uh, that's kind of mostly my brand, also craft spirits. Um, you are the first component listed in the Good Deeds blend, which is mm -hmm. a bottle that I love to talk about. I'm getting the opportunity to talk about it two weeks in a row, which is kind of unheard of. And I was a little self-conscious about that at first, but like, if I'm going to shill any bottle, it should be one that supports a charity. So <laughs> exactly. And what I love about the good deeds blend, uh, from a very That's personal one, standpoint. Way. So the good deeds, uh, single malt that was released, the profits from that spirit benefited, uh, in its entirety, the Step Up Foundation, which provides fully paid internships to non-traditional populations in the distilling industry. So think people of color, uh, LGBTQ, women. Uh, I'm wearing my whiskey and women's rights shirt. Uh, so it's a very important thing to my heart. And all of the product for Good Deeds was donated uh, all of the packaging, all of the uh, labels, all of the taxes, everything was donated. So 100% of the profits for that goes to funding these fully paid internships for these interns. And they go through a year, they go through uh, education at a bunch of different distilleries and also a distributor. They work with RNDC in Texas. And it's an incredible program. And we actually had the honor of hiring uh, one of the graduating classes of interns uh, at FEW. Her name is Erin. I think she might be watching this, which is great. Erin's fantastic. Uh, but she was the inaugural class of uh, the Step Up Foundation. So what you're drinking helped put her through that and created helped create her into the distiller that we hired. So I am very passionate about it. If you have access to Good Deeds and you have not bought it, if you see it on a liquor store shelf, definitely purchase it. It's incredible. Yeah. Yep. Uh, about Erin, uh, I got to meet her at ACSA. She's awesome. Mm -hmm. And yeah. uh, I kind of have an evil plan to get her on our show as well in a few months. Do it. Um, <laughs> especially since we didn't actually get a chance to have any, any few American single malt on mm -hmm. hand this time. We're going to need to take another run at that. So we can fix that. And I can send Erin your way for sure. Uh, no, we're very proud of uh, where she came from. And She's got a very similar non-traditional background that I do in terms of getting into this industry. She came from the world of fashion before she got into distilled spirits, whereas I came from the world of psychology. Uh, and she's really blossomed in her role at FEW. So I'm, it's been an honor uh, training her and working alongside of her. So very proud of where she's come. Obviously, we'll find out more about her when we speak to her, so uh, I won't dwell too much, but I will say I'll share again my favorite story about this bottle, Good Deeds, uh, which was recent. At, uh, at ACSA, there was a silent auction in an event that happened before the conference kicked off. One of the bottles that was available for purchase at the silent auction was Good Deeds. I think MSRP on Good Deeds is about $100, mm -hmm. and if I recall correctly, it actually went at the silent auction for somewhere around $350. So it went for triple its retail price. There were better deals on the table at that moment, right? When the auction was closing, there were things that were still below retail price. So the fact that the price of this bottle went up so high really speaks to how much people want to own a piece of this project. I mean, it the really is a piece of history. Awesome. Yeah, it's incredible. That's awesome. I didn't know that you got it from the the auction and the auction was I did not. for a great cause too. Yeah, so. I, I did not. I actually got this when Joe O'Sullivan recommended it to me oh. right when it came out, which I think was when I was doing my first American single malt advent in 2021. Nice. Uh, he said, you've got to try to get this bottle. I didn't get it in time for advent. So I still haven't actually posted a review of this one because it, you know, it fell down the list as these things do. New things come in, re review the new things. Uh, but I've had this since then, and I, I love bringing this out at appropriate times, For right? Sure. Celebrating diversity. Um, and also, whenever we're talking about blends of American single malt whiskey or blends of like American blended whiskey is an interesting topic that is is very little talked about. 
I love it too, because few makes a blended American whiskey that is absolutely incredible. And we just won quite a few awards for it. Uh, we won a uh, best in the world in its category uh, at the uh, Whiskies of the World Awards a couple of uh, months ago. Uh, our American whiskey is a blend of our bourbon, our rye, and our single malt. And it's kind of this perfectly balanced like trifecta of everything that you would want in a whiskey. It's got a little bit of spice. It's got a little bit of uh, sweetness. It's got a little bit of smoke. Uh, and it's just got infinite layers, like an ogre. <laughs> Yeah. Shout out Shrek. Uh, <laughs> like an onion. <laughs> like an onion, exactly. Uh, but it's one of my favorite things. And the American whiskey category is so misunderstood because people see that on the shelf. And they're like, well, bourbon's American whiskey. No, there's a whole other world out there of whiskeys that don't fit that, that TTB label that are also really incredible. And I think our American is definitely one of them. Now, this is a great blend. Shout out. We had Reed on last week, who was part of the blending team on this one. Uh, shout out to this blend in general. This is a great blend. You can taste mm -hmm. certainly the the whiskeys that I'm familiar with. It's just maybe uh, four of the ones in the list. I could go read them now, but I won't. Um, but uh, so obviously uh, we're talking to you about few, but I already said I don't really know your actual American single malt whiskey all that well. I've tasted it a couple of times, but I haven't had a bottle to explore. Um, yeah. It's Santa a fun Fe, one. you can definitely taste in it. Um, mm -hmm. Balconis, I feel you can definitely taste in it. Um, I, I have tasted Rogue. I'm not sure that I would pick that out specifically. Mm -hmm. uh, but sort of the point being that, like, this is a whiskey that stands as a cohesive whole, mm -hmm. but also you can taste the components and what they're bringing to it. So it's a really well done blend. Yeah. And that's just adding to, if you can find a bottle of this still, you should grab it, audience. Yeah. First, Vinny's first has off, it. Oh, yeah, Vinny's first off, it. I love Joe O'Sullivan and I love Reed. Uh, they're two very good friends of mine. So I love that you guys have had them on and talked to them. They're great people. Uh, I don't know the flavor of the American single malt that went into this specific blend. As I mentioned before, it's changed so much over the years as we've distilled it, as we've refined its process, uh, as it's aging in different cooperage, cooperage sizes and different barrels. Uh, I can definitely tell you though, something like an overarching theme that I get with our American single wall. I've distilled it now for a few and I've bottled it and I know what it, the last batch tasted like coming off the still, it tasted like Raisin Bran cereal. And I still get that in its latest bottling. Like it has this very raisiny cereal quality to it. And I love that. It was really, really fun. That cherry, you think that cherry wood smoke would really carry through. Uh, and it doesn't, it transforms into something very wholly unexpected. Uh, so definitely be on the lookout for the, the few American single malt. It's also got my favorite label that we do too. It features yep. the, the famous Chicago L train. Yep. So me explaining why I don't have the American single malt from few <laughs> feels worthwhile because I certainly tried. Um, none of the liquor stores near me have any more of it. They're all sold out. Uh, so that is, that is a great disappointment to me because I really would have liked to have it, especially for this conversation. Yeah. Um, and I was willing to run that errand and, uh, <laughs> I ended up, I ended up pulling out a goose egg. So <laughs> unfortunately I will say it is our most highly allocated bottle. Um, we only maybe release about 500 cases of it a year and certain markets get more than others. So if you see it, definitely buy it. Like the state of Illinois, I think it's like a total of seven cases. The whole state of Illinois just gets seven cases, yep. uh, which is crazy to me. So something to so keep in mind. So far in Washington total lines anyway, mm -hmm. all I could find was the few rye, which Ooh. I'm not opposed to. I know that I know that Phil would like to have it. But yes. I figured if I'm going to buy one bottle, it should be the American single malt. So I didn't buy it when I saw it and I tried to check out other stores and again, goose egg. So, um, but the, yeah, the few rye I, yeah. real quick for Phil, especially because I know you're a rye fan. The few rye is so special and so different than other rye whiskeys. I like to say that it's a rye for people that think they don't like rye. If you're hearing scratching in the background right now, it's my cat. Apologies. It's okay. <laughs> <laughs> She's totally scratching fine. my my dining room table. We love uh, that. She so the the few rye is as I mentioned before, it's fermented with a wine yeast. And most people associate 
rye whiskey spice with the grain. And that's true to a certain point, but the grain alone is not producing these spice characters, uh, characteristics. The, the yeast is a big component of that as well. So rye and wheat both, both of these grains, they have a tremendous amount of furylic acid in their cell wall. And furylic acid is the precursor for kind of the rye spice congener that we all know. And um, we call it 4-vinyl glycol or 4-VG. Uh, and there are certain strains of yeast that are really good at converting that furylic acid, and there are certain strains that are not. And these are differentiated by uh, either being phenol off-note positive or phenol off-note negative. Most distillers' yeast is phenol off-note positive or POF positive. Uh, it's descendant from hefeweizen and yeast strains, and it's very easily converting that furylic acid. So you're getting a crap ton of spice from that. Uh, it's very aggressive, and that's a big reason why a lot of people uh, back in the day said they didn't like rye because it was so, so spicy. Uh, that being said, POF negative yeast does not convert that furylic acid as much as POF positive does. So we, using this wine yeast, it's a POF negative yeast strain. Uh, so instead of getting all of this crazy spice that you associate with rye whiskey, which I do love, but sometimes in certain ryes can be a little overbearing and heavy handed, you get a lot of stone fruit, you get a lot of sweet tea, you get this really cool herbaceousness that's really, I think, sets it apart in its own category. And that's all because of fermentation. So it's something that we take really seriously. So for those of you guys who are rye whiskey fans, Phil, I know you said that you were, uh, that's what makes you rye so special is this puff negative yeast. Awesome. Well, now I wish I'd picked up the rye. <laughs> <laughs> There's time. You can go get it. <laughs> yeah, it'll still be there. Definitely. Yeah. Uh, as it stands, though, uh, I did actually manage to, uh, to, to, well, I didn't do anything. Lost Lantern actually got their delivery to me sooner than yeah, I expected. Yeah, yeah. And I got the bottle of Few Spirits Bourbon, the 2024 cask number three. Uh, and mm -hmm. I got to taste this last night, last night, and unfortunately, my dinner sort of made my palate a little bit off, but I tried it again mm -hmm. earlier today, and it's really good. It's gorgeous, right? Yeah. It's like, uh, I, I'll, I will stick with my bubblegum note. I feel like mm -hmm. it's like a big league chew, but yeah. it's also it's also just pretty. Like, it's, it's mm -hmm. floral without being flowers. It's caramel without being sugary, mm -hmm. if that makes sense. It's just, like, really well-balanced. And this is such a rare opportunity where you will be able to taste few bourbon at cask strength. Historically, we do not release cask strength whiskeys. Uh, back in the day, our single barrel program was at its highest 101 proof. Nowadays, our single barrel program is 100 proof. We do a bottled and bond single barrel program, which is very cool, but we don't really do cask strength offerings. So for Lost uh, Lantern to keep this at cask strength, uh, really amazing. It, it came out beautifully. I, I ran into Adam, uh, the founder, one of the founders of Lost Lantern several months ago at a, a tasting show. I think actually this was last year in San Francisco at uh, World of Whiskey's Fest. And he mentioned that he really, really wanted to potentially do this collaboration and have us featured in the Midwest collection. I'm like a thousand percent. You guys have been putting out amazing things. And I had met Adam years ago with his work with Whiskey Advocate. So I was super on board and he emailed me and we were able to get them some single barrels that we were really proud of. And they picked a gorgeous one. And it's a collaboration that I'm so proud of. And it seems to be so well received. And it's, it just makes my heart really happy to see all these posts popping up online about it. Lost Lantern has never disappointed me. Mm. And uh, they're, they're a great way to experience a whole bunch of brands that maybe otherwise wouldn't have necessarily distribution because Lost Lantern does a great job of distributing everywhere mm -hmm. uh, through multiple retailers. They're on Sealbox and they have their own uh, delivery times may vary. I think that's the only gripe that people have had. I've experienced long delays. Other people have too. You know, it happens. Uh, yeah. We could say that we'd like that to be improved, but... <laughs> <laughs> What Lost Lantern is actually doing is picking incredible casks and doing a great job of getting it in the hands of whiskey enthusiasts who will really appreciate um, what they're offering. For sure. And their their selection <laughs> process is so vetted. They have such a great... Uh... <laughs> Lost Lantern, Terror Chronicles says, Lost Lantern, we won't disappoint you. Great tagline. <laughs> 
I like it. Yeah. <laughs> uh, but they have such a vetted process and there is not a single thing that I've tasted from them that hasn't been really astounding. And to be included in this Midwest collection, which showcases some really, really incredible uh, producers in our area. Such an honor. Yeah. Really, really happy with how this turned out. And so happy that you got it. Yeah, I'm really glad that I got it in time because I was I was worried that I wouldn't be able to show your name on a bottle that I own <laughs> during yeah. this uh, during this show, which, you know, it stuff happens, but that's still a little embarrassing. Um, I want to take a quick break to just uh, sort of give a shout out to everyone who's tuned in. Uh, Weekend Bourbon says Rise are coming back. That's a comment from Instagram. I see Ryan Legend popped in. Uh, Genji, thanks for joining. Freedom Maltz, thanks for being here. Terroir, Terroir Chronicles, uh, I, I believe this is the first time I'm seeing you in chat, so thanks very much for joining and checking us out. I think that's all the comments that I see, so cool. Uh, Phil, you have an actual own branded Few Spirits bottle. Would you like to talk about that? Yes. Excellent stuff. I am I will be honest, I'm not a huge bourbon drinker. Uh, as much bourbon as I own a lot of it falls into a very narrow category in terms of you know flavor profile and i think that the pew bourbon does a very good job of building on the foundation of the sort of standard you know expected bourbon profile there is some soft fruitiness to it and some really interesting nuance character and I can't, I'm, I, I'd have to actually pull out my notes to give you good tasting notes. Cause at the moment my palate is kind of shot. Um, but it is, it is one that I distinctly recall from trying it yesterday, uh, on a fresh palate that it falls into the category of being very much worthwhile picking up even if you aren't a bourbon drinker because it has a nuanced and complex flavor profile that you don't always get from a sort of flagship bourbon release a lot of bourbons on the market are sort of focused into the profile of we want primarily the the you know sort of those dusty oak and corn notes and less of the more interesting uh, flavor elements that can be drawn from the wood and from the grain and the yeast used. And so it's got this wonderful depth to it that just isn't present on a lot of other bottles. Yeah. And I really appreciate that because, you know, few has been around for 13 years now and, uh, and the whiskey has changed substantially in that time. You know, like many other craft producers, uh, we started with smaller barrels, um, you know, 15 gallon, 30 gallon. And we finally hit that mark where not only are we solely filling in 253 gallon casks, but now we're also only harvesting out of 53 gallon casks. And, you know, these different barrel sizes as well as more refined distilling techniques. You know, you're in the game long enough, you figure out what works, what doesn't, you really dial in your, your equipment. The distillate changes considerably and the whiskey changes. And it's been fun to really see how it has evolved, even in my short tenure as a few distiller. Uh, if you tried few six years ago, you haven't tried few is essentially what it is. It's, it's the best it's ever been right now. And I'm so, so proud of it. Uh, also, I see a quick question from Freedom Malts, if I've been able to taste the others in the Lost Lantern release. I have. Uh, they sent us tiny little samples uh, with our with our few bottle. So I've been able to try the rye blend, and I really enjoyed that. I tried the release from Cedar Ridge and from Starlight. I'm going very slowly through them because they sent us small samples, and I want my distillers to have a chance to try them as well. Uh, so I, I'm making my way through the collection, but everything has been really, really cool so far. And the, the rye blend is fantastic. Highly recommend it. Yeah, agreed. And a follow-up have... comment improved a lot over the, in the past three years while I've been there. No, uh, it, you know, what we're bottling now was distilled long before I came or came around and, uh, 
few has had such incredible distillers in its history that have really uh, established it as such an exciting brand to work for, to watch its evolution, to drink. And it's it's only getting better from here, uh, but it's pretty damn good right now. Yep. Uh, so that question for the audio only was, uh, or so that comment for the audio only listeners, uh, few has absolutely improved significantly in the last three years. Uh, with a follow-up question, it was once a little too grain forward. What do you attribute that to? You know, grain forward is hard to quantify with, you know, chicken or the egg, you know, finding a, a line of reasoning, a easy way to answer that question because people quantify olfactory sensations so differently. You might taste a lot of grain in a spirit, but I might not taste a lot of grain in a spirit and vice versa. Uh, that being said, uh, the stills have changed. Um, you know, we we invested in the column and that hasn't always been there. Uh, that's been there, I want to say, and do not quote me on this because I cannot tell you for sure, but I want to say that's been there for five or six years, but was not there in the beginning. Uh, as well as that bigger Coda pot still, that was also invested in. Uh, larger cooperage, longer aging time. And I think just, you know, really dialing in cuts uh, and a unified tasting vocabulary. So I wouldn't attribute it to one thing. I think it's a lot of things that happen as a distillery gains age um, and figures out what it's doing. And you can see this uh, very, very uh, evidently. There's a question. I was wondering if it was a Cooperage changes, better quality wood. Uh, that I would say no. Um, we have always used barrel mill out of Minnesota uh, since we first started. Uh, they have been one of our longest vendors, actually. We just started incorporating Independence Dave Company barrels this past year uh, to account for kind of the great barrel shortage. And it'll be really interesting in like six years to see how these two whiskeys taste, you know, wood coming from the Appalachian Mountains versus wood coming from uh, Minnesota and the Adirondacks. Uh, it's going to be future me's problem. It's not my problem right now. It's going to be future me's problem to see how that blends out. Uh, but I will say our cooperage is one of the constant things. Uh, we've always used barrel mill and I've been using them even before my time at view. I used them in Florida and shout out barrel mill. Love those guys. Do I have any spirits aging in ex bourbon barrels? Yes, our single malt specifically ages in ex bourbon barrels, which we've talked a little bit about. Uh, we also used to do a barrel rested gin that aged in uh, ex bourbon barrels, but for the most part, our uh, used casks go out of house. We sell them uh, in lots to barrel brokers. Uh, they go out the door like crazy, but I'd love to have <laughs> spirit in softer wood. Yeah. Uh, and, you know, we're, we're very down for experimentation. So we're always trying new things. We're trying uh, different mash bills. Uh, you know, this independent stave wood, we'll be trying that in a few years. We've tried some finishing barrels. I've been experimenting with some uh, barrel spirals recently in, uh, in oak, non-traditional wood and seeing how that works. Uh, so there's a lot of, we, one thing that, about few that I think is really fun is that we're such an experimental distillery. We really like to push the bill on what whiskey can be. And, you know, our bourbon and our rye are very traditional, but we make a bourbon that's been proofed down with cold brew coffee. We make a rye whiskey that's been proofed down with uh, oolong tea. We've used a lot of French oak as well, you know, and all of these releases come out. They're usually very small, uh, but uh, there is a lot of room for experimentation at you. And you've seen uh, quite a bit of that in our company's history. Yep. Uh, I'm just going to, um, once again, for the audio only listeners. So th those comments were um, wondering about spirits aging in ex bourbon barrels uh, with a follow on. I know that's a no, no for specification reasons, but I'd love to know the spirit in softer wood. I'll come back to that point. Um, and, um, terror chronicle chronicles has suggested French Oak. Uh, so that's, that's, that's what guided that conversation there. Um, back to that, uh, no, no for specification reasons. Um, I think what you're getting at is that, um, uh, that if you were going for a malt, like an American malt whiskey specification, then used oak uh, would not uh, would not qualify. But since you're uh, you're doing an American single malt, following the the rules that were suggested for American single malt, 
uh, which allows any type of cask, and you're already aging in ex-bourbon barrels, so uh, seems you're comfortable with that, right? Just putting American whiskey or potentially American single malt whiskey with the appropriate separations of lines and so on. Um, yeah, and, and, and yeah. we're not opposed to using <laughs> different woods for American single malt in the future. Like I said, that's something that we we play around a lot with, with different cooperages uh, and different types of used casks. Um, we've got a really great uh, maturation team. So uh, Skyler Retzleff, he runs our uh, inventory. He runs our bottling line. He manages all of our aging barrels. Uh, Riley Henderson, our uh, operations manager, he manages that too. And then uh, Stuart Conlon is a, uh, he's a barreling like warehouse associate, but he has a wine background. So he's been ordering a lot of really cool French oak and like X wine finishes and things for us lately. And we've recently laid up a lot of really experimental weird things. So we'll see what comes in the future from them. Yeah. Uh, by the way, Terroir Chronicles uh, in chat said that this this was Fed, which I take to mean this is Federal Agent, who was one who is one of the other reviewers on MaltRunners.com, uh, which is a, a coalition of people who used to review things on Reddit before the Reddit mobile apps kind of stopped working, and then we decided to start a blog together. So uh, he's got a great palette. Uh, he's got an incredible collection, and he's got an encyclopedic knowledge of whiskey from pretty much any country I've ever tasted whiskey from. So. Uh, this is a guy who knows what he's talking about. <laughs> Hell yeah. And he also had a, a follow-up comment. Uh, the, um, the cold pressed coffee release mm -hmm. is so good, by the way, everyone. So that's a recommendation from a person with an incredible palate. Yep. We call that the cold cut. So coming out of cask, we use a locally roasted, uh, cold brew coffee that we actually, we get it in kegs from the roaster and we use that to bring that whiskey down to its uh, bottling proof. Uh, and it is such a unique way of uh, proofing. No one else does anything quite like it. And if they do, we were the first to do it. Uh, it, what I love about the cold cut and then it's like sister spirit, the eight immortals rye whiskey, which is proofed down with oolong tea. These are whiskeys that if you tried them neat, uh, and blind, and you just nose them and smelt them and taste them, you would not know that there was an outside flavoring influence. Like it tastes like a very organic product and there's no sugar, there's no uh, sucrose in there that's going to affect how you're, you're tasting those spirits because naturally the human palate gravitates towards sugar, but it's just coffee. And same with the eight immortals, it's just tea. Uh, and it's, it's such a unique project. And I think it makes us really special. And of course the whiskey is bringing a sweetness. Exactly. At least perceived sweetness. There's obviously not very much sugar in whiskey, but for sure. The various olfactory sensations. Give us yeah. Sugar. We're not dosing it with, you know, sugar after the fact, like a liqueur or, or a flavored whiskey. Uh, legally speaking, it's a distilled spirit specialty. Yep. And uh, Freedom Maltz has poured the rest of his few sample from Lost Lantern. Uh, Freedom Malt's got, uh, I believe, a set of uh, two ounce or one ounce samples of the entire spring release uh, when he interviewed Lost Lantern a couple of weeks ago, which uh, you should go check out because Freedom Malt's is another guy who really knows what he's talking about, especially when it comes to American single malt whiskey. So, yeah, go check out his channel. Awesome. And thank you. And Rich, for Rich just popped in. Uh, <laughs> welcome, Rich. Uh, and he's got no few in his cabinet, but listening with a Kaloan because he is a Kaloan stan, if ever there was one. We can as long fix as that for you, Rich. He is available <laughs> in all 50 states and 26 <laughs> countries. We can we can get you some few. Uh, all right. So uh, that was quite a lot of comments from chat. And of course, we're still talking about uh, the whiskey. We could get back to the slideshow or uh, wherever yeah. you want to take this conversation. This is actually a great time to talk about a little bit more. We've talked a little bit about aging and things like that. So if we want to go back to the slideshow, um, the next picture is a picture of our uh, one of our barrel houses. We have two distinctive locations in Evanston. Both are about a mile from the distillery uh, that house our aging barrels. We have between six to 7,000 barrels that are aging right now. And currently we are filling anywhere between uh, three to four barrels a shift and we're working six shifts a week. 
uh, every month. So you can kind of do the math there. We, uh, we fill quite a few barrels uh, for the size of our staff and the operation that we're running. Uh, so you can see here, this is a good picture of this uh, shiny uh, aluminum uh, barrel rings that you see there. Those are barrel mill barrels. And then next to it, the barrel that has the black streaks, those are some independent stave company barrels. So Right. What I'm trying to do right now is fill equal parts independent stave and barrel mill to uh, make this blending transition down the road a little less abrupt uh, so we can maybe blend out any differences that we have. Uh, but each of these locations um, are in non-traditional warehouses. The one that you're looking at currently right now is an ex-ice factory that is in Evanston. The building's about 100 years old, but it used to be used for ice manufacturing. So it is very cool in there. It's very cold in the winter, but it's just very insulated. And you can, in fact, there's still cork on the walls in some parts of the building too, which is really interesting. So I, I go to this building quite a bit because I'm one of the people in charge of barrel transportation. So I drive a 20 foot box truck with filled barrels a few times a week and transport them over here and stack them into these pretty stacks. But that's just another thing that I do as truck driver. Uh, but our other location is uh, located in the same building as our bottling line, which used to be an indoor soccer arena. But same system. Uh, most of the barrels are palletized. We have a few that are racked, but the vast majority of them are palletized. Uh, so if you go to our next slide here, this is a picture of our bottling line, just kind of a brief snapshot. Um, so we have a semi-automatic bottling line that can be operated by three to four people at a time. Uh, at full capacity, it can produce about 500 cases in a day. Uh, and really the biggest parts of what we're doing, we're building boxes, we're loading glass. And that was my cat knocking over her food bowl. She's mad. As one does. She's the worst. I love her so much. Uh, <laughs> But uh, the biggest roles with bottling on a system like this are building boxes, loading glass onto the, the bottler, and then uh, offloading glass, and then putting them into boxes, uh, which sounds kind of monotonous, but any bottling system that you're working can be very finicky. There's a lot of maintenance that goes into them, a lot of upkeep, any tiny variation. Uh, so exa for example, if we get a, a pallet of glass that's like a millimeter out of spec, uh, that'll clog up the bottling line. And we really have to do a lot of labor on that. Uh, mm -hmm. So something I think that people don't think about with distilled spirits, especially with craft brands, is just the sheer amount of time and labor that goes into bottling. So really want to shout out our bottling team at FU because bottling is hard. Uh, bottling uh, is extremely delicate. And they're kind of the final frontier of if there is anything weird with this whiskey, if a bottle is dusty, if there are floaties, if a label is off center, uh, they are the people that make sure that few is what the world sees. Uh, so very proud of the bottling team that we have in place here. But that is essentially what all few production is. You saw the distillery side. That's where kind of I rule. And then um, our eight, one of our aging warehouses, and then it all comes to fruition here at bottling. Uh, and as I mentioned before, after it's bottled, it'll e go out to either any of the 50 uh, states in the country or it could go overseas. Uh, we're in 26 countries overseas as well. So that is all few production and a uh, few mechanics. Any, yeah, packaging teams are the real heroes. That comment there uh, is on YouTube. That is from my very good friend, Caitlin Bartlemay, who I love very much. Thank you for tuning in. Hi. <laughs> Caitlin's incredible. She's a, a brandy distiller uh, out on the West Coast. She also uh, produces some pretty great single malt as yeah. well. Yeah. Yes, indeed. And we are having her on our show on April 25th, if I'm not mistaken, to talk about brandy. So uh, there's a little teaser. A, I have such yeah. a big crush on her and she knows it. <laughs> we talk. <laughs> oh, every so by the way, <laughs> uh, Caitlin just dropped in. So um, since she's a fan of still names, would you repeat your names for the stills for her benefit? <laughs> Bitch, asshole, <laughs> or <whore>, slut, <laughs> baby, angel. <laughs> it just depends on the day. And there goes our PG rating. Um, but we are talking about whiskey. So, you know, who are we kidding? <laughs> yeah. Probably don't show this to your three year old. So many reasons. Um, so many although reasons. we are talking about moderation at some point later today. This is um, very true. 
I just I just want to rib you really quick. Earlier, you said that nothing at your distillery was automated, and you opened up bottling with it's partially automated, which like, I don't blame you. I mean, bottling yeah. is a slog. So, <laughs> so I'll amend that by saying nothing at the distillery. So the place actually distilling the alcohol is automated. Bottling line okay. is in a separate building from the distillery. So didn't entirely lie there. <laughs> and as someone who has done uh, manual <laughs> filling um, on a non-automated line and has, you know, done a four filler uh, system and has hand applied every label and has written bottle and batch number on every bottle that comes off the line, as well as pressed in every cork and put on every uh, sticker on top and heat wrapped every single bottle. It's so labor intensive. So yeah. uh, automated I, lines yeah. are, are, they're a godsend. They're also I the I can't devil. even imagine hand lettering uh, the labels with the bottle, uh, you know, number, maybe not number of bottles, but bottle number, batch number, proof, all that sort of stuff. Uh, I've got tendinitis from a long career of mm -hmm. typing for a job yeah. and also, uh, playing viola and violin. Um, I haven't been kind to my, my right hand is, I mean, my left hand is my writing hand. Yeah. So um, I haven't been kind to that with any of the things that I, that I do in my life and yeah. writing on, I mean, do you, do you hand letter the labels before they go on the bottles? You must, I imagine. So few, we don't do any hand lettering really. Um, we used to do some hand stamping for like single malt or single barrel projects. And those would be like, 20 cases worth of whiskey and we would like hand stamp the side what we call the side strap which is this little sticker that goes on the side of the bottle but on the actual bottles themselves we don't do any hand labeling that's a good example of our side strap there so that signature that you see is pre-printed uh and it used to be actually hand signed by paul oh, back in the let day let me zoom we... in on that phil uh, yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah there you go so there, people can get a good is. look at that yeah uh but for the size that we are and what we output, it's just not feasible to do hand lettering anymore. Uh, you need like dedicated hand lettering teams for that. And we, we don't have the staff and we don't have the patience for it. Uh, doing that down in Florida at the, like kind of the beginning of my career uh, and doing it a little bit at MB Roland in Kentucky as well. When I was there, they were doing quite a bit of handwriting. And I think they still are. Uh, that that is you can do that with a smaller operation but for for what we we push out that's not something that's feasible anymore i would die <laughs> or my team would die and i like them i want to keep them around <laughs> okay so next one moving into our next slide uh something we're talking about a big question about for you is you know where our name comes from and my boss paul he'll never own up to it he'll never say what few stands for he likes to say that few represents a scarcity therefore it must be in high demand if there's few of something people should want more of it and it'll sell more bottles uh we also love puns so if you are out drinking and someone's pestering you to come home or leave the bar you can say no i'm just having a few more and you'll get some really <laughs> cheap corny laughs from that haha -ha. but the prevailing theory is that our name is derived from this woman her name is uh francis elizabeth willard uh she was the national president of the woman's christian temperance union and she was based in evanston where we are and for few and for evanston uh these and Prohibition, all of these things are very closely intertwined. Prohibition actually didn't end in Evanston until the 1970s. You could not purchase alcohol uh, until the 1970s in Evanston, Illinois, which is crazy. Uh, it only changed when a Best Western uh, hotel came into town and they wanted to have a hotel bar. So they changed the law to where if you were to order an alcoholic beverage, you needed to order food alongside of it. So Best Western listed french fries on the menu for a dollar so if you ordered a pitcher of beer you could get french fries and french fries became like the best-selling meal in evanston for a period of time <laughs> so few spirits is the first legal uh alcohol production facility in evanston's history uh, but it was really known as the birthplace of prohibition um and the heart of prohibition all thanks to this woman francis elizabeth willard now 
she gets a lot of flack for this because prohibition was the great failed experiment, but it's also worth noting she was the Dean of Women at Northwestern University. She was pro-women's education. She was pro-women's rights. Uh, she was a suffragette. She was anti-lynching. Uh, she was a really incredible woman for her time. She rode a bicycle. She lived on her own. Uh, she never married. Really, really kind of radical feminist, if we think about it for this time period. Uh, she also spoke on an international stage at the Chicago World Fair in 1893. And a few spirits, a lot of our iconography that we use for our labels comes from the Chicago World Fair. So I know, Phil, you have our bourbon bottle right there. If you hold it up, you can see that statue that you see there. That is the Statue of the Republic, and that was kind of the big focal point of the Chicago World Fair. Uh, if you look at our rye whiskey bottle, uh, this features the world's first electric fountain. So people were astounded by the use of electricity and water simultaneously. Uh, bicycle playing cards made their debut at the Chicago World Fair. So you see a lot of our script on the side of our bottles, kind of as similar to bicycle playing cards, uh, Paps Blue Ribbon. Uh, that Pap, a man named Paps, he brewed a beer that won a blue ribbon at the Chicago World Fair. Uh, Cracker Jacks, there were so many incredible things that came out of the Chicago World Fair. Uh, and Frances Elizabeth Willard was at the center of it. She was speaking in front of 300,000 people at the time as a woman in 1893. Uh, unheard of. And she was speaking in favor of prohibition. But worth noting at the time, at the height of... Uh, alcohol drinking pre-prohibition, the average adult was drinking about five to seven gallons of undiluted alcohol a year. We're talking, if you take away dilution from like beer, uh, proofing liquid, anything like that, five to seven gallons of 190 proof alcohol. That's what the average person was consuming in a year. That's like over a hundred bottles of whiskey. Uh, nowadays, people drink about three gallons of of booze a year undiluted. Um, so alcoholism was rampant. Women could not own property. They could not vote. They could not leave abusive marriages and domestic violence was at an all time high. Uh, and it doesn't make sense. Now we know the economic repercussions of championing prohibition. But if you think about it from Francis's point of view, uh, women were being hurt and her idea was, hey, if we get rid of alcohol, which is really kind of the fire that is lighting these domestic violence incidents on, on maybe we can save more people's lives, more women's lives, more children's lives from it. So she wasn't completely misguided, but she was a really, really outstanding woman for her time. And we honor her quite a bit at FU. I love her. I, I've written op-eds about her. I've visited her grave here in Chicago. I think she was a really extraordinary person. And I think a lot about what she would think of me. Uh, she never lived to see prohibition um, and she never lived to see women gain the right to vote. Um, but I think of the two, she would be prouder of the fact that I can actually cast a vote in a election versus the fact that I make alcohol for a living. But uh, because of this, Few is very kind of closely entwined with prohibition, and you can't talk about prohibition without sobriety, which is what was trying to be enforced. So we can go to the next slide. So conscious consumption, what, what is the benefit of going dry? So worth noting, when talking about conscious consumption, I'm not demonizing drinking alcohol. I'm not saying that you shouldn't drink alcohol. Lord knows, I collect a paycheck from you people drinking alcohol. I love drinking alcohol. It is my favorite thing to do. Uh, I think I'm quite good at it as well. Uh, if you see me at conferences, you'll probably see me, if I'm not presenting after hour, I'll have a drink in my hand. And alcohol is good, but it's important to be conscious of what you're consuming, how much you're consuming it, how often you're consuming it, and what your behavior and your physical health is when you're consuming alcohol. People will react to alcohol in different ways, um, physically, mentally, emotionally. And oftentimes you can really only figure out how you react to alcohol by taking a break from alcohol. So there are a lot of benefits from going dry. And this is something that I quite frequently do. 
Uh, as a professional distiller, you know, I taste off the still every day, but I also make sure that I take a few months out of the year to have dry periods. Um, I love dry January. I think it's a great thing. Um, I'll do a dry period um, somewhere in between like summer and fall. I'll do a dry period later in the fall as well. And it helps me reset. I find that I taste better if I do dry periods. I find that my health is better and it really makes me more conscious of the alcohol in my glass when I do start drinking again. Uh, dry January has gotten a lot of press recently and dry periods in general. And in my industry in particular, it seems like it's been getting a lot of flack. And I don't necessarily understand this. Um, I think a healthier drinking populace is a happier drinking populace. And that can only, you know, rising tides raises all ships. So I'm a big proponent of conscious consumption, of taking dry periods, of uh, being aware of what you're drinking and monitoring overindulgence. It happens to the best of us. It happens to me. Uh, and I'm not saying that you are an alcoholic if you overindulge, but it's worth noting, you know, there is a tie between over drinking and certain uh, physical and mental repercussions. And as someone with a psychology degree, I can speak a little bit more eloquently on the mental ones. So we can go to the next slide. So this is a slide that I presented at the American Craft Spirits Association. So these are some very cheery, very depressing statistics on alcoholism and mental health. Uh, AUD stands for alcohol use disorder. So we're kind of saying that term instead of alcoholism nowadays. Um, it's alcohol use disorder. That's a little bit more of a correct term in how we think of overindulgence. Uh, among people who die by suicide, AUD is the second most common mental disorder and involved in roughly one in four deaths by suicide. What's really worth noting with this particular statistic is that uh, people who often try to uh, attempt suicide and complete suicide that have a blood alcohol content, uh, they find that if you can intervene with someone who is intoxicated and is trying to injure themselves in some way, that it is a fleeting thought that if you can get them to a safe space for an hour or two, that they will stabilize and they won't want to actually complete suicide. Uh, but alcohol introduces such an altered mental state that it is more likely to encourage uh, self-harm and completed suicide in populations. 21% uh, of suicide descendants have blood alcohol concentrations of 0.1% or more. Uh, there's a reason for this. Alcohol lowers inhibitions and your body is designed to not kill itself. That is something that it does not want to do. It wants to stay alive. So liquid courage, um, alcohol, it lowers those inhibitions and makes it a little easier to do these things that biologically speaking, you are hardwired not to want to do. Uh, Pre-existing psychiatric disorders may increase the risk of AUD, alcohol use disorders. So if you are prone to depression, if you are prone to anxiety, if you are prone to anything else that is out there, if you have a sleep disorder, for example, you might be a little bit more susceptible to developing an alcohol use disorder. Uh, a misconception with drinking and sleep is that alcohol might knock you out faster, but it doesn't actually allow your body to descend into rapid eye movement sleep where you're actually getting these beneficial sleep uh, effects. You're not able to actually uh, relax your body fully and let your brain reset. So that sleep that you think you're getting is not actually as restful as you would think it would be. Uh, I personally suffer, uh, well, suffer is the wrong way of putting it. I, uh, grapple with, I uh, work with an act, uh, anxiety disorder every day. I have a generalized anxiety disorder. I've had it since I was a kid. Uh, as I was going through domestic abuse, uh, it was very much heightened and it was one of the reasons I was hospitalized. But I do have to be aware of my alcohol intake. I find that when I drink a lot, I am more prone to panic attacks. I'm more prone to uh, neurotic kind of paranoid thinking. Uh, and I can really work myself into a tizzy if I am drinking too much. Uh, and it's always a big sign for me if I'm a little bit more stressed out that I need to take a breather from drinking alcohol. Uh, Long-term exposure to alcohol may predispose individuals to develop psychiatric disorders. So this kind of goes against that last 
uh, bullet point there, as I mentioned before, this is a chicken and the egg argument, which came first, the alcohol use disorder or the psychiatric condition. Uh, but this is the wrong question to ask. What needs to be asked is how can we treat these things as they happen? Um, they can coexist. Uh, alcohol use disorders and substance abuse disorders, uh, oftentimes they are treated simultaneously. Um, so it doesn't really matter what came first, but what we do know clinically and what, which is supported by data is that they can coexist and they oftentimes do coexist. So going into the next slide, I promise it, this, this is the last depressing one, I swear to God. Uh, before we move on to the next slide, actually, um, maybe I could react to a couple of the points um, from this slide. Um, Absolutely. At least as you were saying, in terms of uh, sleep onset and uh, and quality of sleep, I can relate to that very much. And I have quantified evidence. Mm -hmm. uh, I am a data person. So I am I am wearing an aura ring, um, which I'm actually using in place of my wedding ring these days because um, I need I can't wear them both at the same time because I need to give my fingers a break. I have the kind of skin <laughs> that doesn't like being constantly covered. Um, so I switch sides and all that sort of stuff. And I also have a Garmin smartwatch. So I use this for fitness and it also tracks my sleep. When I have had um, what, you know, what clinically would be considered binge drinking, which is six plus drinks for a male of 200 pounds in my case. Um, and, uh, and even far less than that, I would say uh, three drinks is pretty much the point at which I have a noticeable and detectable quantifiable decrease in the quality of my sleep whether I fall asleep quickly or not is another factor, which may have to do with how sick I feel after after a heavy night of drinking. Um, which this, but just just to be clear for you know anybody who knows me and might be concerned about what I'm saying right now, this doesn't happen very often. This is maybe once a year, maybe twice a year. Um, I've gotten a lot better about moderating my alcohol intake as I've uh, been keeping track of the data, as I've become more interested in dry time and that sort of thing tasting with a spit cup and so on. I drank less at ACSA, I believe, than I drink in a normal week because I was so concerned about the possibility of overconsumption that I was using a spit cup for everything. And I think that was great. I actually slept mm -hmm. pretty well considering, you know, hotel beds are not my favorite thing. Um, what happens when I've consumed uh, three drinks or so and beyond is whether or not I fall asleep quickly, the first four or five hours of my sleep, my heart rate is elevated and I'm showing, I'm showing signs of stress, uh, like lower, um, lower heart rate variation for people who follow this kind of thing. Basically when your body is under stress, your heart rate, your heart rate actually becomes more regular. And we're talking about variances in milliseconds. So not like skipped beats and that sort of thing. But, uh, when you're under stress, your heart rate is a lot more regular and, uh, in smartwatches and so on can detect that now. So it'll actually tell you whether you are experiencing stress or a or bodily stress response while you're sleeping. The amount of stressful sleep that I've had as a result of overconsumption is really eye-opening. Mm -hmm. And uh, if you're the sort of person who wonders, is alcohol affecting your sleep? And you like data like I do, I recommend getting something like a Garmin or an Aura Ring or any number of other devices that can help you actually quantify how your body is reacting to alcohol. Mm -hmm. uh, data is your friend. It helped me. So maybe it can help other people too. Yeah. I, uh, in my own experiences with dry periods, I, uh, am a very cheap broke girl <laughs> historically. So I haven't been able to like purchase like a Fitbit or a Apple watch or something like that. Um, that can actually monitor my heart rate. But, uh, my, the best thing for me in terms of learning how I overindulge and how my body reacts to overindulgence uh, or even not even over just regular drinking, just having a whiskey or two when I get home at night or having a beer after work or something along those lines is doing dry periods. Uh, this past dry January, uh, I had my uh, yearly physical with my doctor at the end of the month. And for the first time in my life, I was told that I had good blood pressure, which was <laughs> amazing to me. I was like, oh, thank God, because high blood pressure runs in my family. And it, I have white coat syndrome. But to hear that for the first time and knowing that I had very purposely taken a dry period for that month and that it was quantifiable by a doctor and put into my chart was such a really like big eye-opening moment for me. And 
I don't understand the flack that dry January gets because it really can have physiological benefits. Now, I will say, though, there is a risk uh, for people that are on that brink or are currently experiencing alcohol use disorder that are drinking six or more drinks every single day. It's important to go about dry periods uh, under a doctor's supervision. Uh, withdrawal is a nasty, terrible thing. It can lead to... Uh, not only anxiety and irritability and lack of sleep, but it can also lead to th more serious things like seizures, for example. Um, so if you're someone who does drink quite a bit and you are considering experimenting with sobriety and going dry, uh, it's good to talk to your doctor as well about how your body might react. And the first, even if you are not struggling with AUD, uh, the first week or two of any dry period might be a little rough. Uh, you might find that you're experiencing some anxiety, some uh, mood changes and things like that. It's just your body kind of self-regulating itself. Yeah. Uh, the, I think here's a great time for me to let Phil um, sort of um, chime in. Uh, so when we, when I, I joined the Whiskey Lodge and sort of when I became a mod, which I think was about six months later or something like that, um, I suggested that we, inf uh, that we, I mean, not enforce, but but have a regularly scheduled dry week for people to opt into if they would like. A lot of the mod team did their first dry week uh, during that time. And I remember what some of the reactions were. I'll let Phil give his reaction to his first dry week. So it is kind of important to note that wasn't really my first dry week because I had been previously a member of a much larger community of whiskey enthusiasts that do regular dry weeks. And I had been kind of doing them with doing dry weeks with them, but it was the first time that I had done one sort of more closely in conjunction with other people that I was speaking to about it on a more regular basis. And there was definitely uh, some conversation about, you know, what habits we had developed in our hobby that, you know, yeah, you know, my, my sort of go-to at that point was I already had some like hard and fast rules for when I would drink and when I wouldn't drink. And one of the things that I realized was that the rules that I had for myself were setting me up for having uh, an easier experience transitioning into a dry period than some of the people in the group who were talking about, yeah, I came home from work and I was, you know, thinking, you know what? I kind of want to drink. And I had to think about, you know, okay, I dry week. I don't have a drink. Whereas sort of, you know, I, for me, drinking is a, uh, feeling good, I'll have a drink rather than, you know, a long day, I need, you know, drink to unwind, you know, and sort of the behavioral differences and the, the connections that the brain makes with, between, uh, drinking and other behaviors and watching the way that you know, we all noticed the patterns that we had developed in connection to when we drank and how often we drank with the connection to how we were feeling and, you know, other external stimulus was kind of an interesting look at how environmental factors sort of affect the way our behaviors develop. And I'm not having a good time of explaining what I mean, but... No. Yeah, you're yeah. good. I, it makes sense to me, and I, I can elaborate and share my own experience there. So uh, Whiskey Laws Dry Week, similarly, I was doing dry weeks with that community that you reference. Um, great people over there. Uh, you know, in the interest of we're talking about the Whiskey Lodge today, there's a reason yeah. that we're not referencing specifically what community that is. But there's a really there's a really well-known community that does dry weeks publicly, so you probably know who we're talking about. Um, or if you don't, you know, ask me later. Um, in any case, uh, so I used to do those um, after I was getting after I'd gotten into tasting whiskey as as a hobby where I was drinking regularly, but with more or less intention. But the regularly was was the the potential for habit forming behavior. Um, so I liked the idea that that they had these dry weeks, and I wanted to carry that with me no matter where I went, no matter what community I was a part of. 
I had also learned uh, from an earlier experience. I had actually, um, I didn't drink until I was pretty much 23. I mean, I, I, I had my first drink when I was 21. Didn't really regularly drink until I was about 23, where I had a work team that would go out for beers on Fridays. And then my usual week schedule in, uh, ended up involving uh, cocktails on a Tuesday and, um, you know, beers with the team on Friday and go out on the weekend, Saturday, Sunday, maybe four or five days a week, I was drinking something and I was keeping track. And what my tracker was telling me was that I was drinking somewhere between seven and 11 drinks a week. What I didn't realize back then is that when you're out at a bar, a, you know, especially if you're pouring a pint of beer of high proof craft beer, 16 ounces at 8% alcohol is way more than one drink. And sort of the same goes for cocktails where they're usually using two ounces of a spirit, which may or may not be 40% alcohol, uh, might be higher and plus other additives, which may also contain alcohol. So you're getting more than one drink for your cocktail. And I, my oh. tracker wasn't taking that into account. And I'd gone to see my doctor and realized that I was drinking more than I thought I was drinking. Blood work showed some concerning stuff. Doctor said, you should take some, you should take some time off drinking entirely. I took three months off. My blood work was perfect. I was like, okay, great. This has taught me something. Um, the first couple of weeks of that dry period, it wasn't a struggle per se, except for the social cues. I had associated going out with certain groups of people with having a drink. And I had to untrain my brain to associate those times with having a drink. So one of the reasons that I think that a periodic dry week is a really good idea is because habits take something like 10 weeks to form. Uh, I think is, I think is what the psychology says. Sydney would know better than me. Um, and, uh, if we do a quarterly dry week, approximately every 13 weeks, that's just on the outside of, and then if you subtract that week that we're dry, we're getting 12 weeks in between dry weeks. Um, that's just enough time to find out if you're starting to form a habit with any of your social cues, with any of your, um, uh, any of your schedule cues, I guess, if you've got any associations between anything that you're doing and having a drink. So for a while it was, if I sit down to play video games with my friends online, I'm going to probably have a drink. I needed to untrain that cue. That was the, the first time that I did a dry week with the whiskey lodge. It was during the pandemic. So everybody was doing their socializing online. I had access to all this alcohol. So getting on, playing a game, having a drink, that social cue, I had to untrain. And I untrained that social cue before it became a problem because I was doing a quarterly dry week where I could catch that before it became hard to break. Yeah. That's why we do a whole that. continuous seven days to mm -hmm. check every element of your regular schedule. I love that. I, for me personally, I love having a drink at the end of a work day the same way that I love starting my day with super strong coffee that will burn a hole through my stomach, you know, <laughs> and both of these things are not necessarily super healthy, but I do genuinely enjoy the flavor of them. Like I love the flavor of coffee. I love the flavor of whiskey. I love the flavor of beer. So something that's been super helpful for me, there is better decaf coffee out there now. So mm -hmm. subbing that in, uh, to my, my coffee drinking habits. Now, if I'm drinking coffee late in the day, I'll try and opt for decaf when I can, uh, for dry periods, um, there's an abundance of really good non-alcoholic beer out there now. And that still gets me into this like kind of ritual winding down period where I'm self-centered, I'm mindful, I'm drinking this flavor that I associate those social cues with a long, hard work day, but I'm not getting the alcohol effect. I'm getting that flavor that I, that I love that I have associated with ending my day. Um, athletic brewing is one of my favorite, uh, non-alcoholic beers. They have a light option. That's like 20, 30 calories a beer. And it's, it's great. I can have one of those a day and it takes the edge off of what could be like a very contentious dry week battle in my brain. You know, there, we are living in such a great time now where, uh, sobriety is not frowned upon or it's not a dirty word or it's not like an awkward silence at a dinner party anymore. Like there are options out there. This is the generation that's up and coming and drinking right now. They're more sober curious than ever before. And there are more sober options out there. Uh, 
incredible mocktails that are very balanced, non-alcoholic spirits. Uh, I'm a big fan of the seed lip products and non-alcoholic beer. Uh, there are options out there that can make sobriety more of a palliative thing if you're worried about giving up the flavors that you've known and grown to love. Yep. Uh, by the way, we got a clarification. Uh, Freedom Malt says 21 days to form a habit, I believe is what that was uh, in reference to. Yeah. Now, I, I wonder, I, I think that applies to daily habits. Uh, I wonder if it's something like a weekly queue, though. Uh, it might be different. I, I think that 10 weeks number is coming from somewhere, but I would have to check sources and so on. But in any case, doing the periodic dry time does let mm -hmm. you check your habits before they become hard to break. You can always For break sure. a habit. Once you become mm -hmm. aware that you have a habit, you can break it. Exactly. Once you it's once just... you have a once you have a, a habit forming substance causing a dependence, then it becomes harder to break. So you want to get on top of that before it's uh, before it becomes difficult. For sure. I also saw a question there. Since my cat jumped up, someone asked what kind of cat she is. Yep. She's orange. That's all I can tell you. <laughs> she's just she's orange. <laughs> That's ah. self explanatory. <laughs> she's an orange, orange cat. Is a good kind of cat. <laughs> yeah. That's all you need to know. Uh, but going back to the slideshow, uh, yeah, <laughs> she is my mental disorder. <laughs> it's that orange cat. Uh, so anxiety disorders, like what I grapple with, generalized anxiety disorder, social anxiety disorder. If you're using alcohol as a social lubricant, you can really feed into that. Uh, panic disorder is also something that I struggle with quite a bit. Um, trying to use a shot of alcohol to calm me down when I'm panicking. If something is going wrong on the distilling floor is not going to help me. Uh, that's actually going to mess up my bank brain chemistry and encourage that panic uh, loop to keep on looping. Uh, mood disorders, major depressive disorder, bipolar disorder. Um, when you're drinking, your mood has a harder time of stabilizing. So you'll see ups, you'll see downs. This is why you have people that are known as happy drunks or sad drunks. Uh, it all um, alcohol is an incredible mood effector. Uh, Post-traumatic stress disorder. This is something that I dealt with coming out of domestic violence. Uh, I, I would have pretty significant flashbacks that I would try to self-medicate when I was in recovery with alcohol before I was responsibly using it. I actually was very irresponsibly drinking and it kind of bordered on AUD for a few years there uh, and found out that I was really just kind of feeding that beast. Uh, sleep disorders, which we kind of talked about there. Doug had great insight with his uh, his data trackers. Uh, and then psychotic disorders, which are a little bit more extreme, but still alcohol can really increase the likelihood of experiencing either auditory or visual hallucinations. And then other substance abuse disorders. Uh, it is not uncommon to see um, maybe like an opiate uh substance abuse disorder alongside of a alcohol use disorder. So all of these things kind of feed into each other. And again, going back to the chicken and the egg, not important. What we want to address is that there is a very clear definable relationship between these things. So going on to the next slide. That being said, we're not demonizing alcohol consumption. Please do not think that I'm telling you not to drink. Please do not think that I'm telling you that you have some mental health disorder just because you drink or because you drink, you're going to develop some mental health disorder. That's not what I'm doing here. These are extreme cases. Uh, and if you are engaging in healthy habits like dry periods and conscious consumption, that is one fortification against these things. Now, life is uncontrollable. Genetics are not controllable. You might already be predisposed to mental health conditions, but uh, you can control your alcohol consumption, and that's what we want to talk about. Dry periods absolutely can be a form of positive mental health practice, in addition to uh, a physical mental health benefit. So we'll go to the next slide. So a study published in 2016 found that even six months later, people in Britain who had participated in dry January drank alcohol on average one fewer day per week and consumed nearly one drink less each day they did drink compared with their alcohol use before the break. So a big topic of conversation, especially in industry circles, whether it's distilling or uh, I've seen a lot of this in bartending communities, uh, 
dry periods are not sustainable. People will just binge drink more alcohol when they actually uh, let themselves drink again. It actually is contributing to a problem. It's not solving it. Uh, there's mixed data on that, but it does seem that there is more positive data that is saying that dry periods can encourage healthier behavior across the board. Uh, so more research still needs to be done. But as a whole, uh, there are quite a few health benefits to going dry. Uh, and it is scientifically backed up. So we can go to the next slide. And then I'll stop boring everyone with my PowerPoint presentation that I'm so proud of. Uh, so just some quick benefits. We've kind of talked about this already. Uh, better sleep, uh, increased hydration. Alcohol is a dehydrant. So you'll have more energy during dry periods. You'll have improved skin condition. I have horrible skin to begin with. So I always see that my skin really clears up whenever I do go dry. Uh, increased sexual function. We all like that. Uh, and notably improvement of liver and heart function. As Doug was talking about and what I've experienced uh, with my doctor, I saw that my blood pressure was better. Uh, this reduces the free radicals that are in your bloodstream from drinking alcohol. It uh, can in improve blood pressure. Uh, it improves your liver function. You're not constantly filtering out uh, toxins. Um, and it's just, it's good for your body overall. We know this, this is scientifically proven. This picture of me was taken. This was my first alcoholic beverage after my, uh, a dry month that I did a couple of years ago. Uh, and I remember it very well. It was a, uh, mezcal cocktail, um, kind of a riff on a Negroni a little bit. And, what I love about this picture, uh, not that, just that my hair looks great and my makeup is done for the first time in my life, uh, but it came off a dry period and I remember the cocktail. It was not just one in a sea of many. It was a meaningful, conscious experience and I appreciated it more because of that. And it sticks out as a memory in my head. Uh, oftentimes, if we're constantly indulging, alcohol loses that shiny special sheen that kind of drew you into it in the first place. So taking these, these periods of time, not only will have physical benefits for you and mental benefits, but also it'll just increase your pleasure while drinking. It will make the, the experience of it more special. Uh, everything tastes better uh, in moderation, you know? Uh, you can constantly eat, you can constantly drink, but your palate becomes very attuned to that and you can't pick up things that you normally would uh, through moderation. Uh, as I mentioned before, my, uh, my palate is never more sensitive than it is when I go through dry periods. And I really like that. It's a very good dialing in period for me. Uh, but this is why dry periods can be good. Doug, Phil, do you guys have anything to add to that? I mean, one of the, one of the keys to a, to really highlighting the benefits of a dry week for, uh, in terms of like palate conditioning, is things beyond just consumption of alcohol affect your palate. And having a period where you aren't consuming alcohol can also allow you to look at how what you eat affect your palate. For example, today I had uh, a relatively mild dinner, but I had a pretty spicy lunch, and that affected my palate with you know food in between to now where i'm not getting as many good notes off of drinking this as i did yesterday because of the spicy food i had for lunch and the sort of all the health benefits aside the when you experience a dry period and then you come back to alcohol it gives you a fresh perspective and can help you find things that you hadn't found before. And it can also lead to, you know, treating each drink with more care. So for example, you know, if I'm, uh, if I'm thinking more carefully about what I'm drinking, I'm going to be drinking higher quality uh, beverages. So I'm less inclined to pour myself 
you know, a, a really inexpensive whiskey <laughs> when I have something that is considerably higher quality. I love the way that you very discreetly hide I was careful not to show a brand. <laughs> Wait, which brand did you hide? No, I, I didn't see it. I was distracted by the cat. Oh, it was it was just uh, it was just the back of a bottle is, is what he was going because uh, we try to keep this yeah. uh, we try to keep our content positive, right? Mm -hmm. uh, we we write reviews. Uh, Phil used to do video reviews on his YouTube channel. Um, most of most of my reviews per se are written down where I give ratings. Uh, I don't like to. We in general sort of agreed. We don't want to do. We don't want to put any negative in, negative impressions out into the world of any brand, yeah. um, unless we have an abundance of positive things to say. Uh, for example, there's some brands where like I'll have a bottle every once in yeah. a while of a single cast that didn't come out so well from a particular brand, but I will I will go on and on about how much I love that brand, uh, just in general, right? For example, so. Um, so in general, we try not to, we try not to call anyone out <laughs> in negative ways, even mm -hmm. if it's, a, even if it's a pretty obvious example. Um, so that's, that's the reason for that, but, but we're, but we're happy we to also... answer any questions if you have them about what we're talking about offline, yeah. you know, just, just reach yeah, out. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. We, and, and we also are the first to admit that we've bought stuff that we didn't enjoy and that, you know, there are things out on shelves that we don't necessarily enjoy and we just don't talk about them very much. Yep. Um, yeah. but the, the I, point I that definitely I have sort funny of enough working my, <laughs> yeah, go ahead. Phil. <laughs> yeah. Uh, the, the point that I was sort of worming my way around to was that consumers having dry periods is good for producers because that allows for consumers to to say to themselves, I would like a higher quality product. Mm -hmm. And if you are successfully marketing your product as a higher quality product, then you will be more apt to be a, you know, find a consumer in someone who is looking for a higher quality spirit now that they have a refreshed palate mm -hmm. or now that they are being more conscious about what they are consuming. And so that is an opportunity for uh, producers to sort of cling on to and utilize to their advantage. And the fact that so many producers, and, and it's a shrinking number, which is good, but the fact that there are so many people in the industry and on the consumer side of the industry who scoff at doing dry periods and dry January and you know, sort of make jokes about it, I think is sort of missing an opportunity for growth. Yeah, I would agree. And I'm not a business person, but I do think that that's sort of a, a glaring business flaw. Mm -hmm. Yeah. There's an opportunity for brands to say, uh, I mean, I, I think it, it's not, from a business perspective, right? We, we like to, as, as sort of industry insiders, as it were, we think of the spirits industry as a business, whereas most consumers are thinking about it in terms of the products they like or don't like and how much they're going to consume and all that. So uh, I can acknowledge it's not good for a brand to, to, to have a message of taking dry time. Yeah. Right. <laughs> That's a tough position to take when, when you're, you're basically telling people don't buy the product that we're making. That would be yeah. hard to do. Um, now the the types of people that are going to watch this show, right? You're you're putting the message out out into the world of take your dry time, uh, but you're doing that as a as a uh, as a producer to other producers and enthusiasts who uh, can take that message with the nuance, right? This is this is the people likely to watch this show are not going to be the general consumer that would be responsible for most of your sales. Yeah, but it, for few specifically, we have a brand identity that was born out of prohibition. Uh, so, you know, this conversation of sobriety is kind of included just from how we built our reputation and how we built our brand and how, like where our history is. Uh, and it's so easy to do these tastings with consumers and talk about Francis and then being like, oh, she must have been the worst, you know, advocating for, for mandatory prohibition. Well, it was misguided. But this is where she was coming from. It starts this conversation where start, people start to reevaluate, you know, 
what sobriety might mean in terms of like a social construct and in terms of, you know, your own personal health. I'm so sorry. My cat is eating my, uh, <laughs> my headphones. <laughs> Say hi sorry. to the worst creature. Seizing an opportunity. <laughs> Hello. This is Firebug. <laughs> Hello, Firebug. Yeah, you can't sit on my lap anymore. Firebug the orange cat. <laughs> yeah, she's the worst. <laughs> but yeah, so we're in a very unique position that I don't think other brands necessarily have. We're prohibition and sobriety is kind of built into our brand story and it starts this conversation. And then you have kind of my background that it becomes a very easy connect. Um, but I, I would like to see it become more of a uh, an acceptable thing and industry conversations. And I think you're slowly starting to see that something that I myself say, and I know other people say is that we'll never say that there's an incorrect way to drink our whiskey, you know, drink it neat on the rocks, mixed, whatever. The only incorrect way to drink it is irresponsibly. And we think of that in terms of, you know, getting behind the wheel or binge drinking, but irresponsible drinking can just also be bordering on alcoholism and alcohol use disorder. Uh, I, I, I sort of went on a tangent about, uh, how to, how to, um, (laughs) how to position this message. Obviously the drink responsibly is, is both a good thing to have and required by law to some extent to have on labels, having a brand that has a message around the idea that make like drink responsibly and make your drinks count and enjoy this really high quality, maybe more expensive. I honestly haven't checked the prices on few spirits. I don't know. Uh, we're about which like, is our regular bottlings are about like forty five dollars MSRP. So yeah. bourbon, so, rye, and their line item priced the same. Right, not bad. Still premium in terms mm-hmm. of uh, categories. Maybe even super premium, unless that starts. That's the one that starts at sixty. I forget. I think yeah, this, it's hard to say that kind of. That's like a moving measuring stick yeah. with more things sure. that are coming that's out. That's not really terribly important anyway. Yeah. But like yeah, that's that's a good price point where this is by no means bottom shelf whiskey price, mm-hmm. right? It's by no means bottom shelf whiskey quality. That goes without saying. Um, <laughs> so, yeah, it's it's uh, that's that's a really good point, Phil. Uh, to to have your dry time makes you appreciate and want to have the really good drinks and make them count. Uh, I I have the opposite story. I would say, um, and and this this was probably you could argue I've done irresponsible things in in a lot of contexts, but I would say my personal feeling of the most irresponsible way that I've ever drank alcohol was I had a really stressful week at work. I, this was one time I had a really stressful week at work and I was like, Oh, it's Friday. I'm going to have a shot of whiskey and then have some cocktails and blah, blah, blah. Um, but this was also after I'd started reviewing whiskey. So my tendency with whiskey was to was to pour small. I still do. That's why my name Demi Tastes come, comes from, right? Demi meaning like partial or small. I usually pour about half an ounce. That's what I that's what I need to evaluate something. I have enough sips, so on. That's the way that I usually drink a small amount of whiskey or spirit slowly. Not very often cocktails. Give me two old fashions and I'm going to be asleep in an hour. Right. That's, that's what that does to me. And, and so like, you know, I'm a lightweight as it turns out, right. Being a whiskey reviewer doesn't mean that I have a a higher tolerance than normal people by any means. Uh, so I had a particularly smooth whiskey from, from a big generic brand that I decided that I would, uh, I would pour a shot for myself to sort of close out my week. And then I would, I would go on into cocktails and everything. I ended up taking this shot. Uh, and then promptly decided that I was not actually going to drown myself in cocktails that evening. And I ended up just going back to my normal tasting of stuff. And by the end, by the end of that meeting, my, by the end of that evening, my conclusion was I just wasted a a, a shot worth of my liver for no reason whatsoever, because I thought that ending, I didn't feel a buzz or anything because I didn't have enough alcohol to follow up that first shot. So it was just a complete waste of liver to have taken that shot in the first place. It wasn't good whiskey. It wasn't enjoyable in any way. It was. It didn't burn because it was a really smooth whiskey. So, like, kudos to Kirkland for making a really smooth uh, whiskey <laughs> that you can go. Um, there was no point at all, and I felt bad about it. I felt I felt that that was a particularly irresponsible thing to do, and I caught myself before it became an irresponsible evening. Uh, but I'll always remember that as being whiskey is worth more to me. Drinking good whiskey is worth more to me than that 
impulse that people might have of drowning a stressful week in a few cocktails mm -hmm. just because. Yeah. I didn't like doing that. I don't do that anymore. Uh, I, I think this is a good segue to my sort of my, I, I like to spin everything in a positive way. And so rather than telling people, don't do this, don't do that. I like to give my example of what I do instead to sustain responsible habits when it comes to drinking outside of dry time. So obviously the quarterly dry week goes without saying we've harped on that plenty. My usual rules for myself in terms of uh, what or how much I drink and when to drink are set yourself up for success that you don't feel compelled to drink a whiskey that you are not enjoying or that you've finished enjoying for the evening. Uh, this is actually a relatively recent things, but I recommend investing in some kind of caps for your glasses. So I use watch mm -hmm. glasses these days. So uh, even just last night, I poured that few spirits. It was late. Um, as I commented on my Instagram post, I had tasted this whiskey. I could tell it was really good whiskey, but also that it was hitting me particularly in a bitter way because I had had a spicy dinner. I know that a spicy dinner affects my palate by decreasing sweetness and amping up bitterness. This has happened to me before, but I wanted to try my best to become familiar with tasting notes on this thing, even though it wouldn't be the best possible thing. Once I had finished getting tasting notes from it, there was no point in me continuing to drink it because I was not going to, I was not going to enjoy it for the sake of drinking it. So I put a cap on it and saved it for today. So that's, first of all, set yourself up for success. You don't have to finish your drinks. If you're not enjoying them, you can save them for later. Second, like Phil was saying, don't drink when you're sad. Don't drink when you're stressed or not because, right? Don't drink because you're sad. Don't, don't drink because you're stressed. Don't drink as a coping mechanism. Instead, drink to celebrate that you're having a relaxing time. Drink to celebrate good things. Drink when you're in a good mood and value your dry time. If you're ever on the fence, is today a good day for a drink or not? The answer is no. Bank that dry day. So I try personally. It's not a hard rule. I used to have a hard rule, never drink alone. Pandemic made that difficult. Uh, my wife doesn't drink. She's kind of allergic to alcohol. Um, so if I'm drinking at home, I'm drinking maybe in the presence of another person, maybe not physically. Maybe I'm in the presence of online people. Um, but my original rule was never drink alone. I shouldn't be the only one drinking. I had to adjust that rule to be never drink if nobody knows that I'm drinking. Drinking should be a social uh, a social thing for me, not a thing that I hide and do by myself. So that's a rule that I really try to adhere to. If I'm ever tasting something for a review, even if it's just a half an ounce of whiskey, which I doubt would ever be a problem, I let the whiskey lodge know that I'm drinking this thing and I share the tasting notes as I go. Uh, I try not to drink more than three days in a row and I take a, I take a day off. It's not great for the content creation schedule, but honestly, who cares? You can queue things up and I'm not that consistent with posting reviews anyway. So <laughs> those are sort of my rules. Keep it positive. Make sure you build in dry time. Set yourself up to not finish something you're not enjoying. Yeah. Never feel compelled that you have to drink. And I was going to say earlier, what's funny is I have more whiskey that I don't enjoy than I could ever drink in my life. Just like just on hand. There's there's you buy things that aren't to your taste. Mm -hmm. You can eventually try to give them away, but like I have, I, I always say I have more whiskey than I could drink by myself in my life. I have to give it away. The funny thing is I also have more whiskey. I don't want to drink than I could ever drink in my life. <laughs> and you know, something, my, my closing kind of thoughts on this as well. Uh, my suggestions for those who are experimenting with dry times or are doing regular dry times, um, Give yourself some grace. Uh, do not uh, come down hard on yourself if if you have a cheat day, uh, if you find yourself slipping. Uh, and also don't view past overindulgence uh, through too harsh of a lens unless you hurt someone or hurt yourself. Uh, that's one thing. But, you know, if you have just a dumb drunk night, I find that it can be very damaging to just like really just recycle that image in your brain and just, you know, punish yourself for that. Uh, oftentimes these things happened when we were younger and we were still developing. So ultimately, you know, this is an industry where we're drinking a substance that is not only intoxicating, but it's addicting and dealing with that and managing that can be kind of a daily thing. So it's important to build in some grace for yourself, some forgiveness and some understanding as you navigate how to healthily enjoy alcohol.
uh, is just be gentle. Um, don't uh, focus on your shortcomings where, when it might come to alcohol, unless you're physically hurting yourself or someone else. Just know that this, this is a process. You're not going to become amazing at sobriety overnight. You know, uh, you might find yourself lapsing here and there and that's okay. Uh, the important thing is that you try to stick with it and you keep these healthy mindsets going as you go forward and it will get easier. Do you have any other advice for, um, people in the industry or enthusiasts, um, maintaining positive and healthy habits as they go about their usual drinking schedule? Um, I find that having a positive industry or community around you can be such a game changer. I'm really lucky that I have really close friends within the whiskey industry that I can talk to you about, you know, drinking and alcohol and then mental health and things like that. So being honest with yourself and also being honest with your friends and your family and having this open line of communication and support, uh, that's the biggest kind of game changer for me. And that's the advice that I would give is to just find that we are, we are stronger as a community. And as you kind of said before, like don't drink alone. I think that is an excellent piece of advice. And I would really encourage that. Yeah. Great. Yeah. So to sort of transition a little bit out of the heavy topic and sort of into our closing remarks here. Uh, so Again, Sydney, thank you for your candor and sharing the difficulties that you had as well as the positive experiences that you've had. Um, it's really great to see that balanced uh, perspective. And uh, just to give a little bit of history on this talk that we're having here. So Sydney and I met briefly at ACSA where she had given a version of this talk. Uh, and I said, that is so in keeping with what we try to espouse as the Whiskey Lodge that I right away asked her if she would appear on this show and she graciously accepted. So thank you so much for your time and for sharing again. That was, it felt like a session where the content may maybe shouldn't be shared or shouldn't be recorded or whatever because of the sensitivity <laughs> and the people that were there yeah. uh, and all that necessarily. Um, so you know, it's great to have a chance to get this out to potentially a wider audience. Um, unfortunately, our viewer numbers were not as high as you might expect. I think uh, there, there unfortunately are a lot of people who do shy away from the kind of content that says, hey, you should, um, you should, you know, watch what you're drinking or know what it's doing to you and that sort of thing. Uh, I still think it's an important conversation. I think that if we lose subscribers over this, uh, it's, it's still worth it because that I would say, you know, maybe that's not our kind of people, right? Yeah. And, and getting that message out there is really important. And my one final thing to round out my my slideshow presentation, I included my uh, my email address there. Uh, if anyone has any questions or comments or is looking for uh, advice on to uh, like on sobriety, on mental health, or just alcohol, um, I'm very responsive to my email. I'm enslaved to it. Uh, as Doug knows, I, I don't respond immediately sometimes, but I do always respond. So you guys are more than welcome to use that. Uh, you can see it there on the straight, the screen. And uh, yeah, that's, that's it for me. Awesome. Uh, besides the email, which um, I won't put that in the YouTube uh, comments okay, because that's, that's, that's a, that's a great way to get spammed. So I will just say, look at the I've video. I've got a filter for that. It's okay. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> look at the video and you'll find it. It's sydney at fusespirits.com. Mm -hmm. Uh, we will put links to other sorts of things like your social media accounts. If you're okay with that, you've got That's a personal, totally so, you've got a personal Instagram, mm -hmm. uh, which I've been tagging on my Instagram. So anybody who's following my Instagram will have already found Sydney. Um, I'll put that in the show notes. Um, as usual, there's a link to the whiskey lodge in the show notes where you can uh, join us to talk about whiskey, but more on average, talk about just about anything else, cars, sports, movies, um, you know, cigars, a little bit, right? There's just any kind of topic that you can imagine. Everything is fair game. The general channel is usually not full of whiskey tasting. We've got a whiskey tasting channel for that. So uh, just about anything else. The main thing is people who like whiskey uh, are generally good people, fun to talk to. Uh, they also like other things too. And you might find somebody in the whiskey lodge who likes something that you're into other than whiskey. And that's a great thing. So check us out. Uh, check out Few Spirits if you've never tasted them. They are really good, and you absolutely should. Um, and you should also check out the Good Deeds Blend, which is a blended whiskey that includes a uh, few spirits. What else am I? I feel like I'm forgetting something. What else am I forgetting? Phil, what am I forgetting? 
I don't believe that you are forgetting anything. Uh, in terms of in terms of social media, I'm not forgetting. I remembered what I wanted to say. So uh, as in preparing for these interviews, I usually go and try to do some research about the person that I'm going to interview, which generally will include things that are written about them or by them or uh, media that they've appeared on or have produced. I did not find a whole lot of interviews with anyone from Few Spirits on podcasts or YouTube necessarily. But what I did find is that Sydney is a host of the Craft Spirits, an official uh, from the Craft Spirits Association, an official yeah. podcast. And you should absolutely check that out because as you can tell, Sydney is extremely well-spoken and a wealth of knowledge and you should hear more from her all the time. So go follow that podcast. What is it called? Uh, so it's the Craft Spirits and Distilling Podcast. Um, if you guys are familiar with Craft Beer and Brewing Podcast and Magazine, they, they've been around for quite some time. I think they're like one of the most listened to podcasts on, on uh, Spotify. Uh, but they have recently started a distilling podcast. And myself and my good friend Molly Troop, who is a master distiller out in Portland, uh, we're the co-hosts of it. So we're going to be interviewing other distillers a couple times a month uh, and posting some really nerdy content. And it's been a lot of fun so far because mostly it's just me talking to my friends, which I love. Uh, so uh, this week's episode just posted. And uh, yeah, it's been a really fun experience recording that. Obviously, we can relate. This podcast started <laughs> just about a year ago with me and Phil and our friend Ian just talking about whiskey stuff and seeing if we could do a podcast thing before we started having interviews on. So Definitely, we love when it feels like we're just talking to our friends, and nice. and that goes for the the relative strangers that we have on every week, uh, who are excellent people like yourself in the industry. We love hearing your personal stories and learning from you. Anything else? I don't know why I feel like I'm forgetting something. Oh, there was a question I wanted to ask you to take it back just a little bit. Um, as as a woman in the whiskey industry in the spirits industry, do you feel that uh, you have? perhaps an undue amount of pressure to drink or to be seen drinking in like marketing settings and that sort of thing. Yeah, sometimes. Uh, and it, it's not ever like a purposeful thing. Uh, and I don't think it's because I'm a woman. I think when I go out and do marketing things, uh, sometimes that there is just kind of this notion that like you go into on-prem accounts, like someone hands you a shot, you lay it back, you talk about business, you order a cocktail, you shoot it back, you order dinner, you order another cocktail. And this is just kind of how it goes. And then you do like three or four other of these visits. Uh, so it's not necessarily like a woman versus like a male thing. It's just, you know, a job thing. Uh, sometimes it very much is just a job thing is that that's the expectation. So I've written about this actually for uh, Artists and Spirit magazine about how, you know, sometimes the dream job can come at a cost and it can kind of play on your anxiety and it can kind of, you have to really be conscious about your health and the decisions that you're making. So I've learned some kind of tactful things over the years while I do market visits. You know, if someone hands me a shot, like I'll take a sip or, and I'll pretend to knock it back and then I'll just hide it you know, in the corner of the bar or I'll, you know, toss it into a plant or something like that. Or if someone gives me a cocktail, you know, I'll maybe take a couple of sips and then I'll just leave it and engage in conversation elsewhere, or I'll take it to the bathroom with me and just throw it in the sink. Uh, so yeah, I think that's just kind of a, a job pressure thing. And I think any, any professional distiller would say something similar, uh, but yeah, I don't think necessarily it's a it's because I'm a woman. I think it's just because I'm a distiller and that's how you make connections, especially with on-prem accounts is with bartenders. And I was a bartender for a while. It's through drinking camaraderie. So yeah. I, I feel I should explain where the where the 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 gendered angle on that uh mm -hmm. question is coming from. Uh I've heard other people say that like uh along the lines of like you're a woman, do you even like whiskey? And feeling that pressure to kind of prove it, I guess, is where, yeah. Yeah. The whiskey and women's rights. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, including the right to enjoy whiskey, you know. Um, there yep. is a really incredible foundation called uh, Our Whiskey Foundation that Becky Paskin uh, created. Hi, Reed. Uh, Reed made it. <laughs> Reed made it. Uh, <laughs> and uh, re uh, Becky started this foundation because, you know, she was a whiskey writer and men were asking, like, do you even like whiskey? Uh, and for me, 
you know, I've gotten questions like that in the past. I've had, you know, a lot of incredulous looks when I, you know, accept freight from a a driver or if I give a tour and I'm talking about whiskey, you know, there's always going to be someone that's trying to one up me in knowledge. Uh, Early on in my career, that bothered me a lot. I am comfortable enough with where I'm at right now that it makes me work harder. And I think it's funny. Uh, That being said, I think we're getting to this point now where women are recognized in this industry uh, and highlighted enough that they're, they're accepted as a norm more. And we know that women enjoy whiskey and that's being uh, communicated to popular culture more now. I was in Kentucky last week and I was in a liquor store and a gentleman approached me and, you know, he asked why I was there. And I kind of said, you know, I'm here for work. This is what I do. Cause he was asking like, well, what kind of whiskey do you like? Not, can I help you buy something? Uh, I was like, do you even like this? And I was like, well, you know, I like the stuff that I make. And he's like, oh, you know, it's great. You know, women have been getting a lot of attention lately and, and distilled spirits They're you know, they're doing some cool things now. And I'm like, well, we've been doing some cool things for a long time. Uh, but now people are taking notice of it. So that's a long winded way to kind of respond that, I have felt that in the past. I don't get it as much anymore. Uh, and if I do get it, you know, it makes me work harder. And yeah, yeah. I, I appreciate the response. And uh, I, I'm encouraged that it seems to be getting better. Mm-hmm. But there's also the, the the number of times where you see just like, are you serious? Do you not know how to act? When? <laughs> yeah. And I, I mean, mean, that's going to be in the conversation with any thing that women are at the center of, you know, this is a great example of, you know, Caitlin Clark and uh, Angel Reese and, you know, women's basketball, collegiate basketball recently, same kind of questions are being asked, same kind of comments are being made. It doesn't really necessarily just center on the alcohol industry. It's just any arena that a woman enters into, these things are going to be asked. Yeah. I, I mean, it goes without saying, and I, I don't need to, <laughs> I don't need to be the one to espouse the values no, yeah. of, of you know, equality and, and all that. Uh, it just, you know, it should be thought of in terms of people, great people exactly. doing great things. And you don't I've need always, to over index yeah. on the fact that it's a, it's a woman who's doing something awesome. That's kind of what I've always said. And I'll kind of leave it at like, I I've never wanted to be known as a great female distiller. I just want to be a great distiller. I just want to make right. good booze, you know? Um, and I'm so thankful for the women that paved the way for me. Um, and I hope that maybe I can pave the way for some women in the future. That's saying a lot, that's supposing a lot about the route that I'm going to take with my career, but it's a dream that I, I have, but, um, at the end of the day, I just, I just want to make good alcohol. I just want to do what I love. And I don't think my gender should have anything to do with that, you know? 100%. Hundred percent. Yeah. Here's to that. Here's that. Cheers, guys. <laughs> so, and uh, it goes with us. I mean, at least as far as Phil and my endorsement goes, few spirits are making really good products, and Thank Sydney you. is at the helm of that operation as head distiller. And we have two other female distillers now. And they have two other female distillers, including Erin Lee. Mm-hmm. And who's the other one? I apologize. Uh, her name is Jamie Fan. Yeah, she's been distilling for about a year now as well. So very proud of her progress too. She came from a bartending background like I did. Uh, In addition to psychology, I bartended as well. That's a whole nother story. But yeah, so we have three women on the staff now. So thank you, Rich, for reminding me what I forgot. Sydney, when you're not drinking few spirits, what do you reach for? Um, I love cheap, bubbly wine. Like I'm talking like sub $10, like really cheap. Uh, Whiskey wise, however, though, um, I love Heaven Hill products. Um, I love Elijah Craig. I love Evan Williams. I love Rittenhouse Rye. I just bought a really great Rittenhouse Rye pick. Uh, So Heaven Hill products are what I drink. And then I also love gin. I used to specialize in gin production. So I love gin very, very much. Uh, so blue coat gin coming out of Philadelphia is, uh, is my favorite. Uh, does, does your affinity for heaven Hill products have anything to do cause cause or effect with the brand relationship between few and heaven Hill? Happy, happy coincidence. Happy coincidence. Yeah. 
Uh, and since I brought that up, just remind me, what is that brand relationship? So Few Spirits was acquired by a boutique portfolio called Samson and Surrey uh, several years ago, um, well before my time. And then two years ago, while I was working for Few, Heaven Hill acquired Samson and Surrey. So Samson and Surrey was our umbrella, and now Heaven Hill is our umbrella. So there's just a few more layers to that onion. Shout out Shrek. Nice. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, and uh, what hobbies or what do you get into when you're when you're not doing your day job? I have a perfect, horrible cat, as everyone saw. <laughs> I also have an even more perfect, not horrible in any way, has never done a thing wrong in her entire life. Dog, who is I think asleep in another room. She's a greyhound. She is the light of my life. So I spend a lot of time with my pets. Uh, I read. A lot. I've started reading more fiction lately. That's been really good for my brain, stepping away from technical manuals. And uh, I am engaged. I'm getting married this year. So my my hobbies have been moving myself in with my fiance <laughs> recently. <laughs> Congratulations. <laughs> Thank you. So those those are the hobbies <laughs> is, is boy, dog, cat, <laughs> reading. Nice. Yeah. Perfect. And reading. Yeah. And reading. Nice. Nice. Uh, at work, what are you geeking out about this week? This week? Just this week? Or recently. Yeah, it doesn't have to be just recently. Um, so we have been doing a line of experimental products that we've been developing with our, our team of distillers. So um, I have four distillers underneath me, Jamie, Fan, Aaron Lee, uh, Stuart Conlon, and Peter Ward. And earlier this year, we gave them an assignment that we wanted them to create two new products apiece. And we would try to focus on experimental development this year. So each distiller was told to come up with a fermentable and a finishing product. So what we've been doing lately is trying to develop some of these products. So uh, Jamie and a couple other, like uh, another person have been working on an Amaro and I love Amaro. Amaro is like a very herbaceous bitter liqueur. Uh, using some heirloom grain, we, we're going to be doing a test distillation that Stuart has been heading up on um, some corn varietals, which will be fun. Uh, Aaron wants to work with buckwheat, also super fun. So things of that nature. I'm trying to help right now. I'm trying to do some mentorship uh, in terms of some recipe and uh, product development. That's been really satisfying. That's awesome. Yeah. Cool. So we've just gotten a little uh, teaser of potential experimental products to come. There's always something different and weird coming out of this distillery. So, <laughs> That's awesome. yeah, it, Keep it, it keeps it interesting. Well, all right. Uh, I think that's the end of my sort of rapid fire questions. Anything you'd like to ask, Phil? I'm good. Okay. Awesome. <laughs> well, great. Uh, in that case, Oh, okay. We have a question from the audience. Yeah, I should ask. Uh, audience, now is the best yeah. time to ask some questions. Let me check Instagram to see if anything came in. Um, just your average wine guy says, love that few gold eagles store pick. Applause. Hey, yeah, that's a good one. Um, and I just did a masterclass at Gold Eagle. Uh, and for that, the release of that store pick, it, it's a delightful whiskey. I tried it when I was doing the masterclass. Um, I see that there's a question from Rich about cedar casks. I have found they are wonderful. I love cedar casks. Uh, we're not working with an entire cask, but we are doing some experiments with uh, cedar uh, wood spirals inserted into casks. Spirals are one of my favorite barrel aging tech things that you can work with. Um, they're not as expensive as an entire barrel. Uh, you can insert them into a barrel. They're basically just, they look like almost like a salami. It's just spiralized wood and it comes in sections and you can just drop it into a barrel and it's anchored by the bung and you can let it sit in there for a prescribed amount of time, a few weeks, a few months. Um, so it's a highly controllable thing. Uh, and you're not running the risk of using a barrel that might not be as watertight as American oak, but you're still mm. getting this really beautiful outside influence of cedar. And you're still getting these really positive oxidative effects from barrel aging by it still being in cask versus just dropping a cedar uh, spiral into a stainless steel tank. So I love barrel spirals. Um, so we've been playing around with cedar for that. 
Okay, I'd love to ask a couple of follow-up questions about barrel aging tech. Mm -hmm. um, so first of all, I understand that TTB, at least initially, was not a big fan of the idea of putting staves or spirals or wood chips into barrels. Mm -hmm. Has that question pretty much been settled at this point, that it's okay? No. <laughs> No, we're doing still, it anyways. <laughs> okay, still an open, still an open question. To my knowledge, we can't rely on the TTB to settle anything, really. <laughs> yeah, to my knowledge, uh, we ha I have not heard any anything that says otherwise. Um, the same way that the TTB was kind of playing around with different like cask sizes and like just like discrediting the use of like thirty and fifteen gallon size barrels. Uh, but yeah, I haven't heard that they have advanced those restrictions. So we are continuing to play around with them because I love them. I think they're super fun. The Cedar Cask, Rich asked if it was released yet. No, this is solely in uh, R&D development right now. But there are definitely products on the market, uh, possibly from few, definitely from other brands that do make use of the spirals or wood chips in the mm -hmm. aging process. Yeah, I first got really comfortable with using them for uh, barrel aged gins that I was making down in Florida. It was a really good way to kind of umph some cool flavors and the gin that I was working with. Uh, and I've started using them up at few and I just adore them. They're they're so easy to use uh, and they're controllable. They're affordable and it lets you have access to wood that can otherwise be really expensive or not practical to use. Like, for example, Amberana is like the really hot thing right now. But Amberana is a protected wood species from Brazil. Oh. Like you can only get so much Amberana. There's only so many barrels that are made per year for Casacha production. And that is shipped out of Brazil because it's a protected wood species. So spirals are a little bit more uh, environmentally conscious and they're so much more affordable. Amberana barrels are so expensive, kind of like Mizunara, just as expensive. Have you messed with any of the smoke barrels that ISC re recently started making? That's a question from Reed. I have not personally messed with them yet, but I did taste some distillate out of those barrels and I'm intrigued by them. I like the idea of smoked barrels because any kind of smoked grain that you work with is going to really kind of fudge up your distilling equipment. <laughs> Um, and you're going to have to do some really intensive deep cleaning on it between like smoked material versus like your regular product. And that can kind of be a pain in the ass. So smoked barrels allows the opportunity of you in, in introducing smoked elements into your distillate without having to go through this kind of deep cleaning headache that you would otherwise have to do. So I'm intrigued by that tech. I have not worked with it yet, though. On the note of smoke and smoked material. Your contribution to the Good Deeds blend that we talked about earlier, Fuse contribution, was obviously 100% malted barley, some of which was smoked with cherry wood. Mm -hmm. Tell us some about the cherry wood smoking process, if you would. So we don't actually, we don't smoke it ourselves. Um, that is a, a pre-smoked product that we get from our malt uh, supplier, Brees Industries. They, uh, they supply us with our distiller's malt flour that we use for like daily production. And then they also have some specialty smoked malts as well. So we get it from them. So unfortunately, I can't speak as eloquently on that as you would like. That being said, I have smoked grain in a past life. When I was distilling for like five whole seconds for MB Roland as a baby apprentice distiller, uh, MB Roland has um, a what they call their dark fired bourbon and their black dog, which is similar to their like white dog. So they, they take their corn and they smoke it with a hardwood smoke. And then they use that to create a bourbon whiskey that they call their, uh, their dark fired bourbon whiskey. So they, they built a smokehouse that is very similar to the way that farmers smoke tobacco in that region. Uh, they were taught by like Amish farmers how to build it that way. And then they get this hardwood and from Amish farmers and then they, they light it, they get it simmering for about three days in the smokehouse. And then they have these trays of uh, corn that they stack in, uh, whole corn. So they'll smoke it and then they'll mill it. And then that is the, the corn that they're using for dark fired bourbon. So I got to play around a little bit with that and uh, understand that process when I was working for them so many years ago. Hmm. Yeah. So generally speaking, that cherry wood smoked grain that you work with, the mm -hmm. barley, 
uh, is that a significant percentage of your single malt products or was that a special sort of small batch that happened to end up in this blend? Nope. hundred percent cherry wood okay. smoked single malt. That's all we've ever really played with. For oh, okay. So, malt. so when yeah. this spec sheet says some of which was smoked with cherry wood, that's actually underselling. Yeah. It, I, to my knowledge, it's always been cherry wood smoked okay. single malt. Yeah. You don't quote me on that because that the product that you was used in that blend came from well before my time. But to my right. knowledge and the SOPs that I have seen, it's always been cherry wood smoked single malt. Okay. And uh, on the question of cleaning uh, your stills and equipment after running smoked product through them, Reed says the trick is to run 10,000 <laughs> gallons of sacrificial wash to clean the smoke out. Man, I wish I had 10,000 gallons of sacrificial wash. I'll have that. <laughs> yeah. It might work. It's just a little <laughs> impractical. <laughs> any other questions from chat? Uh, did I miss any? I don't think so. And anything from Instagram? I'm not seeing anything, but uh, I see that Aaron just popped in. Oh, great. Little Sipper, by the way, is a wonderful Instagram handle that I'm jealous I didn't think of. And I'm I'm glad that I know someone who has a handle that clever. <laughs> Freedom Malts loves good old Wisconsin malting or WI malting, which I think is Wisconsin. Fun fact about Brees, they make great malt. Don't get me wrong, but they also make great malted milk balls. They are my favorite dessert to receive at Christmas time. And when I see them at trade shows. Uh, welcome, Gandy Road. Uh, thanks for joining. It's good to have you here. Oh, I was going to ask you one more thing about Barrel Tech while we were talking mm -hmm. about spirals and, and chips and so on. Uh, did you see at the ACSA trade show? Did you actually go to the exhibits? I did. Yeah, there I were, walked around them <laughs> a little bit, not this, as much as I would have liked. Did, did you see the robot barrel, <laughs> the kegerator with staves inside? No. Is it like a squirrel? Uh, it, it looks like a keg. It's got a glycol jacket for climate control, and it's got paddles that you mount staves on so that you can control the surface area to volume ratio. And they've got some sort of membrane that purports to allow oxygen through, but nothing else. And I have lengthy thoughts on that in my ACSA wrap up uh, episode from about a month ago. So if anybody wants to know, uh, me and Phil broke that down pretty significantly, but I'm just curious what your what your take is on barrel tech or wood aging tech being taken to that extreme. For something like that, I think it's very interesting in terms of research. So you could really dial in on like individual atmospheric conditions that we know affect whiskey, whether it's oxidation or uh, vibration or uh, heat or cold or humidity or whatever else you could really dial in if you have one of these robots and figure out like, Hey, let's mirror the climate that we're in and see what happens to this and like a neutral environment. Um, so from a research perspective, it sounds really interesting uh, because there's so much that we don't understand about barrel aging. You know, we know that there are, are roughly 400 different, compounds that go undergo chemical changes during maturation, but we only understand the mechanisms of about maybe 200, 250 of them. So there's a lot we don't know. Uh, so that intrigues me just from like setting up a bunch of different scenarios and seeing how this distillate shakes out. Uh, that being said, uh, not super practical if you want to have like a hundred barrels in storage, having a robot aging each and every one uh doesn't seem super doable and you yeah might not I, be I was able to i was replicate. being facetious about yeah. the robot thing it's actually not automated it's not oh. like an ai thing and it's just like a keg that has a paddle uh to that you can yeah. with the liquid and, and that sort of thing so either way though, call like it a robot the, because it looks like a terminator in the warehouse you know <laughs> yeah um my statement still stands though from a research yeah. standpoint it sounds really interesting it's just not like the the data that you collect on it might not be easily replicated but you could learn a lot about how your distillate is going to behave under certain conditions. For example, if you were in a really strenuous environment, like I distilled in Florida for four years, and that really did a number on my whiskey just through the sheer amount of heat. Uh, so I would have loved to know how the whiskey that I was aging down there would have done in a colder climate without shipping 
a barrel up north, you know, if I had a glycol jacket on it, that's cool. Let's see what happens. Uh, at the same time, though, because there's so many things that happen during barrel aging that we just don't know, it's hard to control all of these things through a uh, glorified kegerator. But I'm intrigued by the by, by the tech. Yeah, I'm open minded, but not super practical. Yep. Uh, the whiskey shaman dropped in, says hello, and uh, I hope that your tasting yesterday went well. I did not get a chance to watch it. Uh, Freedom Malts, by the way, is running and uh, is running a blind tasting, blind samples bracket right now, which I was on last week, um, where he gave three blind samples out to a bunch of different people, on uh, a bunch of different YouTubers and Instagram people, to have them taste. Um, and I, I think that that's a that's a really fun project and the kind of thing that I would like to do. So, I am perfectly happy. Uh, promoting that i think it's really cool you should go watch it <laughs> the whiskey shaman says no i suck well i'll have to watch and find out <laughs> um there's a couple other questions that came in uh freedom malts asks have you ever thought about or played with black swan barrels from minnesota i've not had the opportunity to no i i know of them and i um uh have seen some of their uh com like some of my industry peers use them but i've not worked with them in my career yet no uh i also see questions about if i've used russian oak or mongolian oak these are two that i have not experimented with yet um i have played a little bit with a hungarian cask though um and that came out that produced some interesting results so I don't remember where, but I recently heard about Bulgarian oak. And if someone that I interviewed told me that, then I'm going to be really embarrassed. But I think that I think that it was a conversation that I had on the side at ACSA, if I'm not mistaken. So interesting. Yeah, just basically oak. I don't know that there's that many unique species of oak um, in terms of all these like oak from so and so country. But we do know that at least in terms of French oak, the specific forest that the oak came from uh, makes a difference in terms of the aging profile. So it doesn't need to be a different species, just a lot yeah. of different. You know, and we see vast differences between American oak, you know, based on region, uh, you know, in terms of grain pattern, uh, tighter grain, looser grain, uh, the stress it undergoes, the heat it undergoes. And the same can be said for other varieties coming from different climates, you know, Mongolian, Hungarian, uh, whatever else out there. There's thousands of different types of oak varietals. The big questions that we have when evaluating an oak tree for its suitability for creating whiskey, uh, is it watertight? That's the biggest question that we have. Uh, so something could taste really good, but if it does not make a watertight cask, then it's kind of irrelevant. You know, and that's where the yep. fun, like that's where spirals come into. But that's a yep. big part of whether or not like a wood will make it into a barrel form is if will it even hold liquid? Yep. I've yeah. uh, I've been dramatically corrected. There's about 435 species of oak. Mm -hmm. My follow up question for that is how many of those are viable for aging whiskey? Because I definitely was more pointing at there's not that many species of oak that are actually used. Uh, in whiskey production, mm -hmm. uh, for better or worse. Maybe there's yeah. some opportunity there. And there will be reasons for whether or not it can be used, uh, how watertight it is, uh, how harvestable it is, if it's, if it's sustainable to harvest, you know, what's the growing time on it? Is it a wood that takes 250 years to mature? Um, the nice thing about American oak is that you can have a fully viable tree ready for harvesting within 70 to 80 years. French oak, a little longer. It takes about 100 to 125 years, but uh, we can produce a lot of American oak, relatively speaking. We are going through a barrel shortage right now, but these oak trees, these different varietals coming from Europe, maybe that grow very, very, very slowly, it's not even worth playing around with them because you couldn't replicate it. There's it's not enough of them growing, you know? I'm so glad we didn't end strictly at seven o'clock because uh, there's some great questions coming in. So, uh, Caitlin Bartley asks, what's your favorite Lord <laughs> of the Rings fun fact? And she also asks, what's your favorite trash dinner? Feel free to add, feel free to answer those at the same time or separately. <laughs> what's my favorite trash dinner? Um, I've never met a noodle. I didn't like, it could be spaghetti. 
It could be uh, lo mein, it could be ramen, it could be just any noodle of any sort, as long as it's a carb and I can eat it until my stomach hurts. Um, my favorite Lord of the Rings fun fact. This feels like a very targeted question. It is like, this is like, question. she knows you have an answer for this. She does. <laughs> it's less like fun facts and more just like quotes that I can do. Okay. Um, but my favorite, like Lord of the Rings, it's not even a fun fact. It's the fact that like Tom Bombadil was never included in Lord of the Rings films or like popular culture, even though he was able to shake off the power of the ring. He was like, he did not fit any mold of any Lord of the Rings character and he should have been so significant, but he just kind of drops out of all collective history. And I want to know what the, what the hell happened to Dom Tom Bombadil, you know? So uh, didn't he show up in the Hobbit or am I thinking of a different character? <laughs> He, he did was, not. I mean, he did not. not that it was. It wasn't. He wasn't in. Oh, I'm thinking of someone else right. who was in the books. Yeah. Yeah. Tom Bombadil keeps me awake at night. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Reed, Reed says, "Don't get me started on Tom Bombadil." <laughs> that, that's my not fun fact about Lord of the Rings: is that Tom Bombadil makes me angry. <laughs> you got any fun character impressions? You could share? <laughs> Feel free not to answer this question. <laughs> Do not have fun character impressions that I can share sober. And we are talking about <laughs> sobriety today. So, Okay, so we'll have you on another time and uh, give you a couple of cocktails and then see your Schmeagol impression. Perfect. No, it's going to be Samwise. <laughs> Samwise. All right, always all right. Samwise. Oh, Disgruntled that's... Samwise. I talk to my that's... cat like I talk like Samwise talks to Schmeagol sometimes. Nice. Yeah. All right. We definitely have to see that. So uh, let's pencil that in for about six months, six months from now, maybe. <laughs> Perfect. Perfect. All right. Uh, I'm not seeing any other questions. So uh, I'll give it a couple of minutes since it's been about an hour since, since my last sort of uh, almost was going to sign off. I will once again say, uh, Phil and I are members of the Whiskey Lodge Discord server. Um, we were actually moderators, and we are about to start our quarterly dry week tomorrow, hence the content of today's talk. Uh, gotcha. Sorry, I just I just saw your message, Sydney. And uh, yeah, let's. Uh, so even if we saw more questions, it's time for us to sign off because we've been we've been live for about two and a half hours, and Sydney has given us way more than the originally scheduled time slot and we really appreciate that um so once again uh go check out sydney and all the stuff that she's up to she's done a lot of writing and she's got a podcast now uh go check out some of the other podcasts that came up in the course of today's discussion and uh consider joining us for our dry week starting tomorrow uh you don't have to join the whiskey lodge to do that but it's a great place to talk about what you're doing while you're not drinking so uh, you can join in the community. And uh, Phil and I, I think, are going to be finishing off our last drinks before dry week as we sign off uh, this show. And to take it back to what we said earlier, uh, to being uh, to being great at what you do with no uh, with no asterisks of gender. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> I love it. Cheers, guys. So cheers Thanks. to that. Yeah. And until next time, we'll see Cheers you in the Cheers with my tea. Yeah. Lancha. Thanks again, Sydney. Thank you guys so much for having me. Thank you guys who tuned in and asked great questions. Um, it means a lot that people want to listen to me because you guys could be anywhere else right now doing fun things. and <laughs> You were here and that means a lot. So thank you guys so much. Drink more for you uh, and drink responsibly as well. Yeah. Drink fewer more. Drink fewer more. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Cheers and good night. <laughs> Cheers, guys. <laughs>